And so the question here is, how do we how do we chart a course for that? What are the major areas where chemistry may play a role, where the U.S. could have a unique contribution? Um, and how do we change basically how batteries are made, how they're sold, and how they're recycled? There have been some exciting developments in terms of recent policy on the part of the U.S. government, the Biden administration's um, passing of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Build Back Better Act really is seizing the attention of Congress and lawmakers. Um, the administration has focused on energy storage as one of the key areas where we need to shore up our supply chain. And so the way they're approaching that is with a, a fairly complex portfolio of tax incentives um, and manufacturing grants. And so the question is, can we increase manufacturing capability here in the US? How do you do that if we don't have control over the raw materials and the mines required for many of the materials for batteries? Um, another key aspect of this is that traditionally in the energy storage um, community, developing a new technology and commercializing it takes between 10 and 20 years. And I would argue that the situation is dire enough that we can't afford to take that long. So how do we leverage our capability more effectively to try to accelerate the discovery translation and commercialization of new technologies. And then finally, thinking about, you know, building manufacturing capability, building capability to um, develop new technologies for energy storage. How do we advance the field? And here is where we, the BCST board, I think I can speak for, thinks that the government would benefit from an expert committee to not only try to help advance the field, develop a strategic roadmap, particularly with respect to innovation, and to again ask the question, what role does chemistry play? I think hand in hand with that, we need to have a holistic view of workforce development. Um, many of the new manufacturing um, facilities that are being built will be in rural areas, as one of our board members pointed out. And so how can we help um, guide the way for developing training at the community college level, the university level and beyond to really develop a robust workforce um, that can target different aspects of this whole manufacturing problem. And then finally, um, a big significant challenge, both in terms of the technology, but also the desperate need is how do we develop the infrastructure for recycling batteries? Currently, lithium ion batteries are made in very large volume um, and most of those batteries end up in landfills. And so both from accessing strategic materials, um, also um, minimizing the impact on the environment and extending cycle life in terms of these batteries, how do we develop um, a life cycle of different applications where these batteries can be used? And then at the end of life, efficient recycling so those materials can go back into the manufacturing um, supply. So this is a complex problem, um, a big problem in terms of both innovation, resiliency, again, in terms of our, our position globally, and then also the impact on the environment. And so what we're looking for today is all of your feedback in terms of um, what role can this committee play? What would a useful product look like? And we'll come back to questions about that at the end. Um, but first, we're going to hear from experts in the field and get some some guidance in terms of not only circular economy, but potential applications for energy storage. So with that, I'm going to first introduce um, our, our first speaker, Dr. Maria Curry Nikanza is um, the Senior Research Advisor and Lead at the National Renewable Energy Lab for the Circular Economy for Energy Materials and the Advanced Energy Materials Strategic Initiative. Um, she, prior to that, had a long career in industry, um, developing uh, teams to do R&D and product development, development at BP and Roman Haas, which is now Dow. From there, she then moved to um, Argonne National Lab as the CEO of the Physical Sciences and Engineering Directorate, so significant expertise in building complex teams. Um, we are going to um, also turn over to one of our other uh, facilitators, Dr. Jody Lukenhaus, who will help with this section. Um, Dr. Lukenhaus is the holder of the Exalta Coding Systems Chair and is the professor in Department of Chemical Engineering at Texas A&M. So with that, I will turn it over to the two of you. 
Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, on behalf of NREL, I would like to thank the committee for the giving us the uh, opportunity to present, to talk about some of our work related to the circular economy for energy materials and advanced energy materials. Um, we will stress batteries, but we do uh, more than batteries here at NREL. So I will just highlight a couple of those other areas as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so I will um, give NREL as, at a glance for those of you who are not familiar with NREL, followed by uh, a discussion about our critical objectives and in particular, the circular economy for energy materials. And then what is the circular economy? I'll briefly go over that. And then how do we apply the circular economy at NREL? I'll give an overview. And if time permits, uh, then I will discuss some of the research gaps that we see both cross-cutting basic science and applied research that's related to today's discussion. Next slide, please. At NREL, at a glance, we have more than 3,000 employees, and of those 3,000 employees, about 600 are, and we have more than 600 early career researchers, as well as the visiting scientists. We have world-class facilities, uh, we have over 1,000 partners from industry, academia, and the government, and, um, and we have an incredible campus that's just full of life and buzz, in particular now because of all of the uh, funding that's coming from the current administration. Next slide, please. At NREL, we have um, what are called three critical objectives. One is integrated energy pathways, where we're focused on the um, grid in terms of thousands of devices that are going to have to be connected to the grid, communicating with the grid. And how do you do that uh, and not bring the grid down? How do you do it in a resilient way, in a cyber secure way? For electrons to mo molecules, you can think of this as focusing on um, converting biomass to SAF or the use of hydrogen for uh, fuel cells, for mobility, for stationary. Um, and then with the circular economy, our focus is and uh, the circular economy is the uh, critical research area that I'm going to focus on today. Next slide, please. OK, so what is the circular economy? Um, according to the MacArthur Foundation, the circular economy is an industrial system that is restorative or regenerative by intention and design. It replaces the end of life concept with restoration, shifts towards the use of renewable energy, eliminates the use of toxic chemicals, which can impair use and aims for the elimination of waste through the superior design of materials, products, and systems. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. There are essentially, there are about 14 circular economy pathways, but 10 that I think, are, uh, according to our scientists that are the main focus of research, they start with refuse, refusing to use or minimizing the use of toxic and hazardous chemicals or materials. Rethinking design from the very start for circularity, so making it easy to disassemble, recover, and separate out valuable materials. And then reduce the amount of materials that we use. And in terms of extending the lifespan, uh, repairing, refurbish, repowering, remanufacture the lifespan of these materials, keeping them into the economy for as long as possible. And when it's no longer possible to keep them in the uh, economy uh, as is, then let's recycle them in a smart way so that we're recovering all the value that we can. Next slide, please. It used to be that when I would give this presentation on the circular economy, uh, I would primarily focus on the waste generation in terms of being a reason that we should definitely be practicing circularity here in the US. Um, for instance, if we look at batteries by 2025, uh, it's expected that at least six 
100,000 metric tons of waste will be generated with wind turbine blades, 300,000 metric tons by 2038 in Europe alone. And then um, for photovoltaic, 78 million metric tons by 2050 globally. Next slide, please. Excuse me. But now, because, and I think we owe it a lot to COVID, there were a lot of smart people who were thinking about the supply chain implications of the clean energy transition long before COVID came around. But I think when we had the supply chain disruptions with COVID, it certainly made everybody stop and pay attention that uh, we cannot possibly have this transition. Um, and let it and it go smoothly, and uh, America retain its economic competitiveness if it's business as usual. We have to focus on supply chain resiliency, and one answer to that supply chain resiliency, among several, is the circular economy, the materials, the metals, the um, minerals, all of the the mining and extraction that we have done early on, if we can keep all of those materials in the economy for as long as possible, then we, we need less of those resources. And uh, as was stated earlier, some of those resources are not in um, the most, uh, are, are in some geopolitically sensitive areas. So we want to maintain our competitive uh, uh, economic competitiveness, the circular economy can help with that. We have concerns about continuing growth in demand of those materials because you know parts of the world are getting that are developing are also uh, desirous of consumption of materials. We also have the clean energy transition, and so we have to really be prudent in terms of how we manage all of these supply chain um, pulls. So um, the circular economy can help to mitigate some of, some of this impact on materials demands. And um, another area that it can help by reducing the amount of extraction that, that is required in um, areas where there is conflict mining and the use of child labor, hopefully we can eliminate all of that or eliminate or or influence better behaviors uh, and also uh, reduce the environmental burdens associated with mining. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, we've already addressed, and I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly uh, as an example related to um, battery technology. We've addressed some of the supply chain issues. So if you look at this particular slide, you will notice that the Democratic Republic of Congo is the major supplier of the cobalt that is used in the uh, in a number of our LIBs. And it is most of their supply is contracted by China. And then that those contracted ores are refined primarily in China. And that gives the Chinese an opportunity to own a fully integrated supply chain all the way through the production of the batteries. If you look at the bottom in purple, that's where the US is currently right now uh, in, um, in terms of mineral supplies as well as in, uh, in, uh, and in terms of use for batteries. Next slide, please. This story repeats itself with lithium. It's not so much um, the Democratic Re Republic of Congo that is the major supplier for lithium, uh, but one of our good friends, Australia is. But much like Congo, Australia has uh, devoted a good bit of its supply to China, and that supply goes to China to be refined and helps um, in terms of China having a strong manufacturing base for batteries. And looking at the bottom in purple, you see where the US currently is situated. Next slide, please. 
nickel, uh, a similar story, but not so much um, having the uh, raw materials in a uh, friendly place. Notice they are in Russia and China, but broadly dis distributed, more broadly distributed than cobalt for sure. Um, but again, the refining primarily takes place in China and, um, and gives it a competitive advantage in terms of uh, battery manufacturing. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is NRO doing about this? Well, we have uh, the circular economy for energy materials, and our vision is to lead research that maintains energy technology products, components, and materials at their highest utility and intrinsic value at all times, and mitigate negative externalities such as materials depletion, land, soil, and water pollution, uh, while promoting sustainable energy systems that improve global emissions, efficiency, environmental quality, economic prosperity, and social equity. Next slide, please. Thank you. We focus primarily on redesign, so designing from the start for circularity, uh, for reliability, extending the useful life, of these materials and devices and systems, reuse anything that um, we reuse it long before we recycle it. it. It might be repurposed for another use, but certainly want to extend uh, the utility of these components and then recycle at the very end of life, like when we have had maybe multiple lives in the same use for a device or a um, component, then and only then do we want to recycle it and take it down maybe into other component parts or down, um, down cycle it uh, for other uses. But our preference is with recycling to upcycle. Next slide, please. This is part of the team that makes it all happen with the circular economy for energy materials. These are more the leadership and then behind them are a number of very brilliant, very smart postdocs and early career scientists. Next slide, please. In addition to um, part of our research, in addition to our internal teams, we are also part of a number of consortiums. So uh, US MAP focuses on next generation PV, and in particular with perovskites, we lead that. Uh, we participate in Remade. We uh, co-lead resale, advanced battery recycling, and I'll talk in greater detail there, but the lead organization for resale is Argonne National Lab. Uh, for IACME, which focuses on recycling for wind and then Duramat with PV and uh, a variety of others, as you can see here. Next slide, please. Sorry. Next slide, please. Thank you. We take a multidiscipline team approach in terms of analysis. We usually have uh, at least one or two people on per team on uh, the circular economy research teams that does focuses on the analysis, the modeling and analysis piece. We do materials. We usually have um, a materials processing expert who can help with the design with um, uh, materials uh, design discovery and characterization. Device systems, we have individuals who know how to fabricate and also disassemble and, and design the devices for ease of disassembly. And the reliability lifetimes, um, we have a team of people who are very good at developing testing protocols um, that can be used for certification of uh, reuse of different uh, components as well as different systems. Next slide, please. With modeling analysis, we cover uh, life cycle analysis, techno-economic analysis, equity and workforce, supply chain, um, and circular economy. And we have a team that's constantly working to do kind of macro models that can do a number of these analysis in one system. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, we have a website if you want to know more about our modeling and analysis capabilities, our analysis capabilities, um, you can go to the link below. Next slide, please. 
Okay, I'm gonna go very quickly through PV and I'm just gonna talk about next generation PV. Uh, as I said before, it focuses on metal halides. And um, also we want, it also focuses on uh, how can we do glass glass separation? How can we uh, uh, collect the flat glass? Because that is a huge weight uh, component of the, uh, of the modules. And, um, and also how can we uh, enhance the circularity of the bifacial silicon modules themselves? Next slide. And we answer questions, not just with PV, but with all of our research related to, does the existing manufacturing processes enhance remanufacturing of valuable recycled materials at an economical cost? If not, what has to change? If the solution is, is the solution scalable and economic? And that applies to batteries, uh, turbines, as well as PV systems. Continue, please. Okay, continue because I really want to get to batteries. We also participate in the Duramet 2 consortium. And the goal here for Duramet is to see if they can extend the useful life of the modules, the PV modules to 50 years, and to understand what are the degradation and end of life uh, processes so that we can counterbalance them. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, and so in the field, we do a lot of infield testing. So uh, the junction boxes, the back sheets, the cracked uh, glass, uh, the cracked glass, the interconnects. Um, we um, collect data for ourselves and also for industry to let them know how are these different components uh, surviving and operating in the field and how can their weaknesses be mitigated. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, and then we have a modeling analysis tool called PV ICE, which is an open source analysis tool that quantifies the mass and energy flows uh, in the PV in PV manufacturing use and at the end of life accounting for the virgin material inputs, the energy output, and um, eventual uh, disposition. Next slide, please. And we participate in a number of international uh, standards working groups, uh, PVCAT being one of them. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're at batteries. Batteries. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so this audience is uh, probably far more experienced, not probably, far more experienced with batteries than I am. But um, we know that batteries are going to be in very high demand in short order. By 2030, it's uh, estimated that there will be at least 20 million EVs on the road. And so that's going to consume, uh, require a lot of cobalt, manganese, nickel, et cetera, uh, to manufacture the uh, primarily used uh, battery, which now is uh, NMC. Uh, but in general, with batteries, you have the cathode, the anode, the separators, you have a variety of, of uh, chemistries for each. And you can also uh, mix and match the cathode, anodes, and the separators. You also have the electrolyte salts, um, the solvents, a variety of solvents and additives such as binders um, that are part of the, the complexity of the mix. And we are only um, recycling about 5% of the lithium ion batteries today. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are we doing about getting the recycling rates up and um, basically doing the hard work of understanding the complexities of these systems and using them to our advantage in terms of recovering a lot of the valuable uh, materials. So the Department of Energy um, uh, Office uh, Vehicle Technologies is spending quite a bit of money in this area. Um, to in four, excuse me, in three areas. One, the Lithium Battery Recycling R&D Center, which is resale. Two, next generation low cobalt battery research. So going from like NMC 111 to the 811s and, and others in between. Um, and then um, 
recycling the recycling prize which really focuses on some of the early stages like collection and separations technologies um, to lower the cost and make it a lot more a, a lot more efficient in terms of collecting the uh, spent batteries next slide please Okay, so there are basically three approaches to um, breaking down the batteries at end of life. Um, and so resale's mission, and resale is now focused on all three areas. Uh, previously, the main focus was on direct recycling, but it is recently expanded to cover both pyro and hydro uh, recycling as well, processes as well. Resale's mission is to decrease the cost of recycling lithium ion batteries to ensure future supply of critical materials uh, and decrease energy usage compared to raw material production. Uh, as I said, Argonne National Laboratory leads this. Um, there's Worcester, uh, Polytech as a participant, Michigan Technological University, UC San Diego, and um, NREL as uh, participants in the uh, consortium. Re as I said, research ha uh, resale has expanded to hydro processing. And with hydro processing, basically you're using assets uh, to dissolve the materials and to, um, and what's produced uh, is leached out uh, as metal precursors. And then with pyro is an intensive heat applied to the battery uh, to kind of burn off the organics. Um, and what you're left with is the slag that then is um, separated using the hydro processes. With direct recycling, it's although the other two pyro and hydro are a lot more mature at, uh, commercially, direct recycling uh, Although it's in the early stages, it so far uh, may provide a more efficient route to recycling that that uh, eliminates the use of high intense heat um, and also the use of of, um, of uh, chemicals like very strong acids. And so you have a, both an environmental and an energy benefit with the direct recycling. Next slide, please. Okay. With the direct recycling, which has been a key part of NREL's focus, um, we start with that end of life battery. It is shredded, not at NREL, it's shredded at Argon, but NREL has a role in the shredding process in that we help to develop the safety protocols because we have a facility that will allow us to pretty much abuse batteries in a very safe way. And so we develop the protocols and then we confer with Argon and others who are doing shredding um, to help them to do it um, in a way that will do no harm. Um, then there is the electrolyte recovery, which we do not participate in, uh, but others do. Um, we take that um, shredded material at, at the cathode anode and, um, and do cathode anode and metals separation uh, to form what is called a uh, black mass. And with the black mass, um, we separate the cathode out, we separate uh, the carbon black, and we're working to try to separate out the PDF. Um, once we have the cathode separated out from the sy system, we relithi, uh, NRO does do a relithiation process to upcycle the cathode. Uh, and then the cathode is then, um, uh, once it's rejuvenated, it is put back into the battery manufacturing process and uh, then uh, then use and then the battery is used and starts in the closed loop system once again. Next slide, please. Okay. In addition to uh, the direct recycling um, area that we focus on, we also manage the v VTO's uh, recycling prize, which is focused in uh, five areas, the collection, separating and sourcing, safe storage and transportation, and reverse logistics. Next slide, please. 
Okay. And we also have um, a modeling analysis tool uh, called Libra, which characterizes the full circular economy for batteries. So um, cost of resources during extraction is a part of it, as well as kind of some of the environmental impacts changes in battery chemistry, uh, doing um, material and product design, uh, that because generations and in particular batteries, the generation of batteries are constantly changing. And then designing what is the impact for designing for circularity, um, including information about battery lifetimes, potential market sizes, uh, collection and transport costs, uh, some of the second life market areas, um, including that information into the modeling analysis tool, and then what type of recycling approach is being used, be it direct, pyro, hydro, and then how do we safely dispose of materials uh, when we've taken all the value out and do it safely. And I think I'm running out of time. Am I correct? I don't want to go over time. You're okay. You have about another 12 minutes or so. Oh, great. Okay. Next slide. Thank you. Okay. So CE for wind. And I'm going to be very brief here, but just to give you a taste of some of the other areas that we work in. And so um, we do polymer upcycling in, we, in particular for wind. And this is really an area for one of my colleagues. Um, my co, another, we have another co-lead for the Circular Economy for Energy Materials. His name is Bob Allen. And his space does polymer upcycling and in particular for wind turbine blades. And so some of the epoxy amines that are currently used, Enroll uh, uh, has research to, to produce bio-based um, uh, anhydrides that are used as part of the epoxy linkage and, excuse me, the epoxy and hydride linkage that ultimately can be reversed. And so we can break down the uh, components into their monomeric precursors and then reuse them at the end of life. That is the concept. And we're well on our ways to realizing this. Next slide, please. We have uh, the composite manufacturing education and technology facility where we actually do manufacture uh, 13 meter long uh, wind turbines. And um, so we can do not only the development of the polymers, but we can do the fabrication and we can also test the performance. Next slide, please. And it's just an example of the thermoplastic uh, wind turbine blade that recently won the R&D 100 award. Next slide. Okay. And you can see more of uh, our facility and the process of fabricating that uh, 13 meter thermoplastic blade. Next step, next slide, please. Okay. And um, what uh, some of the research questions that we address are what is the impact on actual technology field performance and cost of utilizing new blade technologies, reclaimed or used and or recycled materials products compared to using legacy primary materials and products. Next slide, please. Okay, and also, as with all of the other areas, we also work interna on international uh, working teams uh, to help to accelerate um, reuse, repair, um, circularization of clean energy technologies. Next slide, please. Okay, so some of the gaps, um, standardized testing pro standards, uh, in terms of standards, we need standardized testing protocols and new testing tools um, for rapid assessment of state of health, safety, durability, and other critical performance factors for clean energy technologies. And this does definitely apply to batteries uh, once we reuse, repair, and re recycle. And then uh, two standards to help develop warranties, objective pricing mechanisms to design robust business models and, enha and enhance customer trust. And three standards for digital systems used to track and monitor flows of energy, carbon and materials globally. Next slide, please. Um, 
Okay, simple regulatory gaps. Okay, some of the regulatory gaps. A detailed comparison and analysis of the impact of local, national, and global end of life regulatory practices. Analysis of how policies serve to incentivize and disincentivize circular economy behavior and practices. Um, we have gaps in permitting clarity on how electrical building and fire regulations will apply to second life systems like um, using batteries uh, on the grid and, uh, and uh, PV for grid and non-grid applications. And then certainty in terms of warranties and liabilities for second life systems. Uh, and finally, clarity and consistency in regulatory waste uh, classifications for uh, interstate transportation. Next slide, please. For basic science, and these are just examples, uh, disassembly with novel adhesive technology. Um, we need some, some novel adhesive technology to um, do two things, to make it easy to disassemble some of these components, but at the same time, those the components have to maintain their performance characteristics. So they have to be able to be in um, multiple weather conditions and still old, hold up for decades. Um, we need basic research on replacement technology for like uh, ethylene, vinyl acetate, laminates, but in particular, and I'm sorry, uh, I, the focus is on battery te technology. So we do need um, focus on some of the uh, adhesives, the glues that are used in the battery technology so that it makes it easy for disassembly, more technology options. Um, yeah. Uh, we want to replace uh, flammable toxic and fluorinated electrolytes and solvents without neg negatively impacting functional features like energy density and lifespan with batteries. Next slide, please. For modeling and analysis gaps, we need to uh, we incentivize manufacturers and other key stakeholders to share uh, more of their protected information but in a way where the information will be uh, maintained pub, uh, privately. We need, uh, so we need information in terms of the bill of materials, the processes, more details related to the processes that are used for recycling. We need better integration of technology, environmental, social, policy, regulation, behavioral, and economic performance factors in circular uh, pathways to identify the trade-offs, the hot spots, and the overall best strategies for, um, for uh, capturing that the value in the in the um, end of life systems, we need assessments of how many local, regional, and national firms offer circularity services for clean energy technologies, um, including locations for collection and recycling. Uh, capacity, their capacity for recycling, annual mass recycle, percent recovered, et cetera. There's just a lot of information gaps that would help for us to further refine um, our predictions if we had uh, even greater, higher quality data. And um, we need analysis at relevant geographic uh, geographic scales and temporal frequency projections of decommissioned clean energy technologies that incorporate significant factors leading to end of life, such as the failure modes, the performance degradation over time, how they behave in extreme weather events. Um, and then uh, we need to improve the sensitivity of our analysis. Um, and then finally, uh, analysis of small scale decentralized facilities uh, should be compared with uh, more centralized facilities. Next slide, please. For digitization uh, gaps, we need to incorporate more robotics. We need more manufacturing automation, uh, the inclusion of AI and ML in designing for circularity, uh, for high throughput synthesis, characterization and performance evaluations. We need to 
uh, really become more mature in terms of using blockchain, echo labels, digital passports, QR codes, and RFID, um, so that from point of origin to the end of life, we're able to monitor uh, what's happening to that component, to the components, and also how are they performing over time. And then communication and transparency of data to help stakeholders in the use phase of select appropriate maintenance uh, repair activities. Uh, we need better communications um, and blockchain, echo labels, digital passports, QR codes could help with that. Uh, we need real-time monitoring of system performance and diagnostic technologies to enable more efficient repair and thereby increase the functional life of systems. And then we need to optimize siting of end-of-life infrastructure through geospatial analysis tools. Next slide, please. For applied research, uh, we need validation of economic and environmental impacts of using uh, LIBs to um, use batteries to provide a wide range of grid services in second life applications currently uh, in second life applications. And uh, we need research on the effectiveness of standardized designs for efficient automation and decommissioning and disassembly. Um, impact on CE of using replacement adhesives, laminates, and non-lead soldering techniques, uh, and further research to optimize, um, well, I'll skip down a bit because some of these are for PV. And um, so we want to increase, basically we want to um, have applied research that will help us to optimize methods for recovery. And, um, and reuse in a both open and closed loop system. Next slide, please. Okay, I think I'm within the time allotted. Yeah, that was perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for your um, presentation. Um, I want to uh, remind our uh, virtual attendees that you can ask a question by raising your hand. Scott, I see you already. Um, and then um, also, if you um, uh, aren't able to raise your hand virtually, if you're in person, Amy can um, uh, uh, help with moderating as well. Um, so we do have some um, questions um, already kind of pre-populated. So I'm going to take the first question and then um, Scott, you can take the second question. Um, so uh, the first question I have for you um, is what is the biggest barrier to achieving circular energy materials and what needs to be done to overcome this barrier? Okay, um, so I think one of the uh, biggest barriers is we have to develop the technology to make it cost effective, com cost competitive to landfilling. Um, and, you know, thank you to the Biden administration. We're getting a lot of research dollars to help us to bring the cost down for recycling. Uh, we also, what will help us um, Bring down the cost even further is to work more closely, I think, with industry uh, so that we can make sure that some of the solutions that we want to apply really do, um, do help with their systems, are easy to adopt within their systems, as opposed to uh, have requiring a great deal more of uh, capital investment. So those are a couple of areas that I think are challenges. Very good, thank you. Um, I see Scott next. Yeah, Maria. So I wanted to correct one of your uh, your charts to highlight the importance of what you just talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the adoption rate of EVs is far faster than what you showed, and it emphasizes the importance of the circular economy. The chart that you showed, and I'm in industry. I work for Dupont, so we kind of track yeah. these things. Yeah. You showed 2026 having over 10 million EVs and 2029 having over 20 million. I will see all that has been pulled forward five years. We hit 10 million EVs last year. 
next year we're forecasted to hit 20 million EVs. So I just wanted it. It's really important. It is. You're right. Uh, it's going and much I, quicker than we ever thought. Every time we see these EV forecasts, they're doubling and they're they're rapidly increasing. So your chart was probably like your your uh, Bloomberg report was probably a couple years old. Yes. It's going way faster than we ever thought, which highlights I, the importance of what you're working on. And thank you very much. I know I'm modeling and analysis people are probably cringing right now, Scott, and saying, I can't believe she used that old uh, report, that old slide. Uh, but yes, I totally agree. Uh, when I saw it this morning, I thought, oh my goodness, I think based on all of the money, uh, just with the BIL, that these numbers are definitely outdated. So yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Scott. I think that highlights some of the challenge with um, uh, addressing this issue is the numbers are changing every day. Yes. Um, and it, it kind of looks like it's getting um, more critical every day, um, but it's, it is hard to keep up. Um, Gerard, you're next. Thank you. Uh, very impressed by the holistic approach <laughs> that has been shared with us, including okay. failure mode, multimodal, mathematical analysis of the economy and everything. So this is very impressive. Uh, I have one question, and uh, I'm speaking by ignorance, maybe, is how do we think about the importance of envisioning the user interface? And I get it for electrical transportation. I think that's probably relatively easy, but are we also thinking that electric um, appliances and device will also have to be replatformed from uh, uh, energy material advanced conservation? And what strikes me is, should we not study what will be the bottlenecks that the users, the people in their today life may either encounter or maybe some of the benefits they can extract for it. So I did not see any user interface. And as I was looking at your multifaceted, amazing work, which is really impressive, how should we think about the human element of the ultimate users? Uh, if uh, if they're on, we have a group at Enroll that does agent-based modeling. And so if I had taken the time to go through our models, that would have been one that I would have covered. And we apply that to all of the clean energy technologies and in particular batteries and EVs. Um, and so those models allow us to see how decisions are being made. OK, and made based on the benefits to the particular stakeholder, um, not just the manufacturer uh, or the recycler, but also the end user. So I always use this example. I'm one of those uh, end users with cars where I will hold on to a car for 15 years because I see a certain benefit from that. OK, well, how does somebody like me? Um, in terms of the decisions I make about buying an EV, let's say, um, how does that factor in? Because I don't like buying new cars, but yet I need to get an EV. And probably when I, I do purchase an EV, I'm going to hold on to it for 15 more years versus my neighbor across the street likes the latest and greatest of everything and he can afford it. Uh, so um, how do you factor in the purchasing behavior of both of these groups and the benefits that we get, um, the reluctance that the end user may have that is this, I can't find charging stations, so should I purchase? Um, at the end of life with this battery, what do I do with it? There is an, uh, you know, when it comes to lead acid batteries, there is a mature market there, but what do I do with an EV battery? And then who's gonna pay for the replacement of that battery and how much is it going to cost? So we have modelers, um, analysis people who are also factoring in that decision-making process, the impact uh, and the way that the end users will behave. So if I may, that really increased my confidence in the program, what you say, looking at the end user. Mm -hmm. I think this is maybe something we can think for other recyclability of plastic and material. The end user is important. May I ask a last question? Are you also thinking about the end user for not the car, but appliances and device, or is it something that you will look at at the later phase? We are, okay, so NREL is a really big organization. Um, 
in terms of appliances, we have a whole team. We have a really an, a building that's devoted to um, energy efficiency with appliances. And I would not be surprised if they are working on the circular economy related to those appliances. Terrific. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that discussion also shows how important the social component um, can be mm -hmm. in um, uh, transitioning to a circular economy. Uh, next, I see George Crabtree's hand up. So George, you can get in there. Uh, great. Thanks so much. Uh, Maria, wonderful talk. Uh, and I like the previous discussion that you were highlighting, John, about um, what about the end user? How does, how does the end user feel? I would, so I want to point out two things. The first one, just a comment that yes, the end user is very different if it's a consumer or if it's, let's say, a business or a big you know, organization or the government. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to make rather rational decisions and they'll all make about the same decision because they talk to each other. Whereas mm -hmm. consumers, as you pointed out, Maria, have very different points of view. Right. You like right. a one-year-old car or you like a 10-year-old car. And right. uh, right. you know that's, that's <laughs> not in common. Yeah. So uh, it might be easier to start with the institutional consumers because the, you can predict a little bit better how they're gonna react. And that's simply a comment, but and maybe you have some reaction to that comment. I, I wholeheartedly concur with you, George. And nice to see you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and, and our modelers would be probably they're jumping up and down and going, that's exactly right. And uh, they cover all of the agents, but in particular, they cover government, they cover the manufacturers, they cover the, um, the recyclers, uh, all of the business, the B2Bs, they've covered um, extensively in their modeling and analysis. So yes, you're right. Uh, the consumers are part of it, but they're not the biggest part of the analysis. Yes. So second question or comment would be, uh, it seems to me that recycling and design to recycle has been left out of uh, the just the thinking generally. And I, I know batteries better than other things, but uh, we never designed the lithium ion battery to be recycled. In fact, it's a nightmare. And uh, that was always a second thought. Now we're starting to, some of us are starting to say these words, uh, but I'm wondering if in order to get it into the national consciousness a little bit more firmly, we should have an earth shot that's on recycling. We have, I have something like eight earth shots, earth shots now and none of them are really related to recycling. They're all related to new technologies, but how are you gonna recycle that technology once you develop it? So uh, just a question. I love it. I love the idea, George. Um, I, you know, I, sometimes people, especially scientists, we feel like, well, recycling, uh, being an earth shot. But I think the more we educate each other on the huge benefits of circularizing the way that we use these materials, I do think that we will see that it is scientifically worthy of our time and of our attention. And it is really critical that we uh, use this as part of our all of the above strategy for supply chain resiliency. So yes, an earth shot for recycling, would love it. And uh, definitely, uh, NREL will probably follow up with you too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, let's talk some more. Yeah. Excellent. That uh, touches back on some of the closed door session discussion. Um, where we thought, oh, do we need like a Manhattan project where we design a battery from initially from the chemistry itself so that it can be fully circular and, and not just, you know, settle with, okay, we have a lithium ion battery. How do we recycle it now? Let's redesign the chemistry from the, from the beginning. Um, yeah. So uh, next we have a question from Anoop Singh. Thank you, Jody. Hi, Maria, great talk. And uh, I wanted to follow up on George's question because I had the exact same question. You know, manufacturing for recycling, right? I mean, and 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 it, it's the entire process. I will just tell you, I'm at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. I run the engineering directorate. I have three FTE, electronic technologists, 
just to get the batteries out of every single iPhone and iPad. Okay, and these are the people who also design tables for weapons. So this mm -hmm. is how much expertise is needed. So imagine if if a, a consumer wanted to you know get the battery out. I mean, Apple makes it intentionally impossible to get it out. So so it's not just about the batteries themselves, but the <coughs> product that use the battery. I mean, if you can manufacture them to make it, can't, can't, why can't I hit a button and the battery just pops out? I, I mean, you know, to end user. I mean, if you make it easier, that's the only way they will recycle. So if you're thinking about that. Uh, we are trying to think about using robotics to do that. You know, yeah. uh, uh, love to hear more. The second part on recycling: what are the bottom? Is it a chemistry problem, or is it uh, a scale-up problem, or both? Um, any any insight into that, so that this committee can kind of start thinking about it? Is there anything you know we can do to help? Okay, so I think there are a couple of questions. If I were a recycler. Um, well, if I were someone who was thinking about getting into the recycling business for batteries, um, the, of course, besides the technology, I would want to know, okay, is this, am I going to be able to uh, make this facility profitable? And when you think about some of the changes that we're making, which are perfect uh, in terms of reducing the amount of cobalt, or nickel in the battery, that changes the economics of some of those plants. And so we need the plants, we need them to be built. Um, we need them to be built in a way where we, you don't create environmental burdens on communities. So how do we as a nation do this? Because we're going to dematerialize. We're going to use probably materials. We'd love to use uh, non-rare earth materials um, for some of these technologies. Um, so, but for batteries in particular, now you have changed the economics. LFP, if we look at LFP, recyclers really don't want to be bothered with LFP. Uh, they're making the manufacturers or whoever generates the waste pay them to take LFP off of their hands. So how do we, as a nation, because we see that um, we want to recycle all of the above, whether it has great value or not, uh, economically, but it has other values to the, um, to the economy, how do we as a nation address that? Um, do, we, do we cover the cost? as a nation for the capital investments for those areas where they're not com cost competitive. Um, yeah, do we help, okay, add features like robotics, which will likely, it'll save labor cost, but upfront, you've got to make that investment. Do we help with that upfront? Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of dimensions to what you have to consider if you're going to get into this game and if you're going to make money with this game. Um, and some areas, the federal government is going to have to step in and help because they just there's no economic feasibility to it right now, at least. That's a good that's a good point. And then by the time, you know, if 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 we if we don't plan appropriately by the time it is economically feasible, it might be too late. Like we may not have developed all the infrastructure we need. Well, if we, you know, we should learn from our mistakes in the past. Right. Like yeah. if you look at lead acid batteries, okay, they're recycled now, uh, but over time, and I think even recently, we've seen articles where whole communities are suffering from chemicals that leached into their, their into the groundwater, destroying the soil and trying to get clean up and having difficulties getting the companies that had the poor practices a long time ago um, that created the problem, having difficulties getting, because they're bankrupt. So they have no money to go in and do the cleanup. If we start thinking from the start, 
uh, now with, and I love this earth shot idea, um, again, George, we start thinking from the start, we can avoid some of these issues in the future. So we, we do need to learn from uh, our, mis our past mistakes. Okay, next we have a question from Tom LaGrasso. Thank you, Marie, very nice presentation. Um, I wanted to make a comment about the earth shot. Actually, there was an exercise, an ideation exercise, I think happened during the spring through the summer, looking at a recycling earth shot. And I can make connections to the um, people leading that effort. And, and, um, but it would be a good connection. And I agree, it's needed. My Thank question um, goes to kind of some of the economics um, and the use of digital labeling or eco tags. Um, you know, batteries in particular, you showed a nice table indicating at least, uh, you know, half a dozen or more different chemistries. And, you know, when, when we start trying to recycle a variety of devices, that contain lithium ion batteries, then that feedstock is variable. And that presents a real challenge for someone to build a factory, to do the chemistry um, in a way that, that is efficient and not having to tailor everything. The other aspect to that is if you don't have a way to sort, then you just got this black mass, as you talked about. I, well, I'll talk a little bit about that and what we do, but you're, you end up going back to the elementals and you're starting over from really a, a very early stage in the supply chain, losing a lot of embodied energy. So could you tell us more about the activities around um, uh, labeling and the work with the standard standardization agencies to somehow affect that sort of part of the recycling challenge? Okay, so um, notice I said that that was a gap and that is an area that NRO is chomping at the bits to do research and work collaboratively with like um, um, the battery consortiums, um, but we have not as yet done a lot of work in this area. We are planning to start doing some work uh, in terms of robotics and QR labeling in IRA, but, but we haven't started. That's something that we recognize as a need. We have to find the funding for it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think to follow up on that idea, um, is there any resistance from industry um, to having their batteries recycle, you know, to enter into a recycling program because maybe they don't want other people to know what's inside their batteries? Yeah, that is one of our challenges is the proprietary composition of the batteries. And so how do we create a consortium where industry feels safe. Mm -hmm. um, they know that their information will be protected, will be safeguarded, much like we've done, uh, the Department of Energy has done with, um, let's say, fuel cell technology, mm. um, where it's under the proprietary information is under lock and key, or the same um, with PV technology. We definitely need to get to that place with uh, a consortium with battery suppliers um, where they will share information, but it will be protected information that will only be used in analysis and there will be no ascribing and it will be presented in such a way that you cannot uh, kind of back calculate what the compositions are <laughs> of the batteries, et cetera. So yeah, um, we would love for such a consortium to uh, emerge that will include mm -hmm. industry, academic, academia, and the national labs um, so that we can come up, because that's the way that we're gonna come up with the best um, circular economy solutions for the industry mm -hmm. and for the nation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
we have about four minutes left for questions. So I want to remind people if you have a if you have a last question, um, now is the time. Um, I'm going to take one more question, and then I see um, George um, can go next. Uh, so my my question is. Um, when we're considering recycling and recovery, a lot of these processes that you mentioned, um, they look like they have a really high carbon footprint or energy footprint. Um, so how much should we care about uh, like the carbon or energy footprints of these processes? So like, great, we're recycling and we all feel good about it, but what if we just made the environment worse by doing so? <laughs> so um, what are what are your views on that? I uh, completely agree with you. That's why we do modeling and analysis of the processes, <laughs> because you can have something that is low cost and is technically successful, but a disaster. And I'm going to have to apologize because I just looked up my <laughs> battery is going low. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Sorry. Okay. This is being recorded, so. <laughs> so sorry. Um, yes, so it can be cost-wise successful, um, maybe depending on your um, definition of technical success, but we have to look at um, the overall impact, the impact on society, the impact on the environment. Um, in addition to the technical and economic impact, we need to do, we do the life cycle analysis. We're now factoring into our analysis um, the, the um, social um, impact and in particular on frontline communities. So yes, we, um, we cannot identify a pathway without knowing all of the benefits as well as the burdens that are going to be associated with what we choose to do. So high for so if you're going to order them, probably in terms of carbon and energy intensity, um, pyro metallurgy is probably um, the I don't want to say bad actor, but probably presents the most challenges. And so it gives us the opportunity to do a lot of good research around those areas. And then the hydro processing with the um, strong assets that are used there, um, we probably can find some uh, more environmentally friendly approaches to help with those separations processes. Mm -hmm. Probably the most, and I wouldn't say benign, mm -hmm. but the, um, the least environmentally impactful right now is the direct recycling mm -hmm. pathway. That's right. Thank you. Um, and so um, I promised George the last question. Um, so uh, to keep us on time, uh, I'll, I'll uh, kind of impose brief question, brief answer, perhaps, and then we'll move on to our next talk. George. Yeah, thanks. So very brief. Uh, there are lots of different battery chemistries out there, which you alluded to, Maria, and um, some are a little bit radical. For example, what's coming in five years is probably a solid state electrolyte, mm -hmm. which would require a different kind of recycling than uh, the liquid electrolytes we have. Is this a barrier? I mean, are people w uh, unwilling to invest in, re in developing the recycling technology for a given battery, given that it it may decline in popularity or there may be more competitors coming along that complicate the issue. I have a friend who works in this space and um, they are monitoring the changes because they're coming pretty fast. Um, and coming up with a business model, we're okay. Um, they will pass the cost on to um, the receivers of the recycling <laughs> materials to help counterbalance um, any economic deficits in doing the processing. That's the model that they are going forward with. So far it's working with, as I said, LFP, uh, NMC works um, for, I mean, in, in a, NMC is economical because of the cobalt content and the nickel content right now. 
So no worries there, but they are certainly monitoring the changes that are happening. And, uh, and then he uh, particularly mentioned the solid state electrolytes um, that they're not sure in five years what's gonna be coming at them that will completely upset um, their strategy. So yeah, all of this is being taken under consideration, George. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, that concludes, um, that includes uh, the discussion portion. Um, Dr. Maria Crate Nakanza, um, I applaud you. I thank you so much for your talk and um, insights. Thank you for the invitation and for the great questions. Okay, um, so next I will be introducing um, uh, Tom Lagrasso in just a moment. Um, this next session will be moderated by um, Dr. Shelley Mintier and Amy Prieto. Dr. Shelley Mintier is an Associate Chair of Chemistry and the Dale and Susan Poulter Endowed Chair of Biological Chemistry in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Utah. And our next talk is going to be from Dr. Tom Lagrasso. Um, he is the director of the Critical Materials Institute. He's been a member of the leadership team since the inception of the Institute, leading the developing substituting focus area. He's been a material scientist at the Ames Laboratory since 1988. His background is in solidification physics, and he's applied his background to the synthesis and design of new and novel materials in single crystalline forms. He is the co-inventor of a rare earth free substitute for the magnetostrictive alloy terphenyl D, which is used in small engine components in petroleum exploration. Tom, we look forward to your talk and thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and hopefully you are seeing a PowerPoint presentation that is in full screen mode. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Great. Okay. Well, um, first of all, thanks. Thank you to the board for giving me this opportunity to describe the work we're doing. I want to thank Maria for providing an excellent background both for the framework of um, and the background for my talk. So I will go over that part really quick, as well as the questions and answers, which really sets up some of the outcomes that the uh, R&D efforts that we um, are pursuing in CMI are trying to achieve, like reduction in energy density and carbon footprint. So um, we are an energy innovation hub um, our mission is to develop innovative scientific and technological solutions to secure, to develop robust and secure supply chains for rare earths and other materials important for the clean energy transition. Um, we are a public private consortium led by the Ames National Laboratory with three other national labs, Oak Ridge, Livermore, and Idaho National Laboratories. And we have 15 universities and 32 companies whose uh, NASCAR logo banners is shown at the bottom. But it's really important to have this ecosystem um, surrounding the technologies, especially when supply chains don't exist because um, it really does require um, when one has an innovation to surround it by a set of companies that can feed the um, uh, feedstocks into the process and of course, enter into the offtake agreements. Otherwise, well, frankly, the technology gets orphaned. So we are driven toward a sustainable future. Um, really the two driving of, of all the national initiatives, the two that are important for CMI is the electrification of transportation, which we are targeting obviously by 2035 and net zero carbon emissions by 2050. To achieve that transition, um, it's not just um, uh, the change in the makeup of electric vehicles going to a much more um, larger variety of minerals that are needed for an electric vehicle, but also in the power generation, offshore wind, and solar PVs become um, more dependent on minerals. So really the fuel, uh, we're, we're really 
the transition is a fuel is from a fuel intensive to a material intensive transition. So um, I won't spend a lot of time on the next slide because Maria covered it very well. Um, the vulnerabilities, um, there are lots of sourcing um, for rare earths. Um, the circular diagram shows a very inner ring is mining. And USA is, is now um, producing 40,000 metric tons of rare earth, mixed rare earth concentrate. Um, and we are the second largest producer. Um, unfortunately, it all goes to China to get separated into the individual rare earths and in particular, the magnetic rare earths. And this is a story that, that uh, plays out for, across all of the mineral space. So really the vulnerabilities or the gaps that we have in our supply chains are in the midstream and, and, and downstream uh, manufacturing. And so we focus on trying to address some of the challenges associated with that, uh, those, those parts of the supply chain. Um, in the end, our goals are to diversify and expand the supply of materials in the appropriate quantities needed for clean energy transition through unlocking domestic sources. And appropriate quantities um, takes into account the temporal need, right? And right now we need to be able to produce a lot of these minerals in order to meet the growing demand for, for, for example, for the EV transition. Um, there's also needs longer term. Um, and, and how are we going to address the sustained needs? And that's where maybe recycling can, be, can become a significant part of that equation. We need to reduce the energy intensity of mineral processing and materials processing by at least 50%. We're gonna to go to renewable energy sources. They, we have to be able to make these materials in the most energy efficient way. And finally, of course, we need to decrease the environmental health and water usage associated with production of critical materials. As the last question pointed out, pyrometallurgy, um, lots of energy. Hydrometallurgy, lots of toxic chem or harsh chemicals. We need to be better about protecting the environment throughout the process. How do we meet these challenges? I'm sorry, how do we meet these goals? Um, we've kind of developed a, a, six different challenges um, associated with critical materials production. First, we got to know what's going critical. And so um, as, as indicated, a lot of modeling and analysis about vulnerabilities and gaps in supply chains. We use other people's analyses as much as trying to do our own. Um, but can we anticipate criticality and can we find solutions before we run into a situation where we have a, a drastic need or a black swan scenario. Um, we need to recover critical materials from unconventional sources and how can we do that through smart mining practices and responsible mining um, and, and open up and optimize the processes to not just unlock unconventional sources, but also the primary sources. Um, how do we minimize waste streams? Third, we need to develop highly selective extraction and separation from complex sources. And this applies both for the upstream and geologic uh, ores, but also to recycle. These are complex sources. Um, whether it's the mineral you want in a sea of, of rock you don't want, or the rare earth magnet in a sea of aluminum and plastic and circuit boards, how do you extract things effectively? Uh, and selectively. Once you get these materials in a form, how do you convert them into a refined product? We don't use elemental lithium. You know, well, that might be a bad example. We don't use um, uh, rare earth oxides typically uh, for, for transportation uses. We need to be able to make the uh, metals and alloys and magnets. So can we go more direct processing from the mineral to the magnet? That would be great if it could be one step great process intensification. Unlikely, but there are ways to, be, to have more direct processing paths. Water management is becoming more and more important. Um, most of the sources are in, in, in uh, areas that are challenged, they're arid, um, and use of water is very important to the communities. Um, often the most important factor, don't contaminate my water. 
So if you're using it, how do you reduce the use? How do you remediate it? How do you reclaim the water? And how do you reinsert it back in? So the circular economy applies just to water. And then we need to do this also very fast. Um, can we increase the speed of discovery and integration, not only to meet the immediate short-term needs, um, but the development cycle for materials, for manufacturing, for acceptance, um, understanding lifetime, um, how do we incorporate that into a, a validation scheme that um, allows new technology, new innovations to be uh, deployed uh, quickly. CMI has focused, um, as I said, on um, electrification and, and generation. Um, we group the materials we study um, into three uh, classes, permanent magnets, which drive EV motors, as well as wind generators, and there we're concerned about rare earth elements, and cobalt. Cobalt is used in magnets, um, often uh, to compensate for, for less rare earths, but um, uh, for lithium ion batteries, um, lithium, cobalt, and graphite have been our targets. Nickel and manganese are important and they show up in the recycle streams and, and, um, and, and so we pay attention to those too. And then finally, electronic materials, gallium, indium, tellurium, these all fall into a class um, you might call byproducts or co-production. And those actually are very important um, from power electronics and solar energies um, uh, applications. Um, so our approach is to, to really take a look at, uh, across the supply chain. Um, we're not just gonna focus in on say beneficiation um, as the second step after mine, or first step after mining, say how can we extract material better from the rock around it? But, but also what's the form that it comes out of this stage at and how does it feed into separations and so on and so forth um, around kind of these five simple uh, supply chain stages. And of course, there's the circularity that applies both within each stage as well as between stages um, that, that factor into our, our selection of, of R&D projects. Um, we do three basic approaches. If you don't have enough of a material or if that material is, is subject to a supply chain risk, then you can mitigate that risk by diversifying supply, developing new expanded sources um, and developing more efficient ways to utilize the sources you have. Develop substitutes, of course, maybe the word better, better word is alternatives. Um, are there alternative materials providing similar functionality that uses less of your critical material? And of course, once you have that material, uh, being good stewards, how do we reuse it, recycle it? Um, and then we do have a fourth uh, category of R&D projects that are cross-cutting. Um, they, they address uh, tools that will enable our science. They can be thermodynamic uh, databases, um, uh, computational tools for ligand design, and, um, and, and they just help the other three areas. Uh, they accelerate the development in, in, uh, of the R&D of the other three areas. We look at environmental sustainability um, because that's an important factor, and, and then ultimately supply chain and economic analysis. We do early stage research, um, generally TRL two through four, um, we're fairly productive, um, but mostly what we've created is a network of 45 plus active team members across the criteria, critical material supply chain. What that does is it allows midstream people to input on the upstream processes um, and the upstream to kind of understand, well, if I produce a lithium hydroxide, um, that feeds directly into downstream processes. So um, we are in our 10th year of operation. Um, we've strongly or have had a strong education and workforce development program. And um, we're proud of the, our alum who've gone on 
both into national labs, universities, and the private sector in, in these fields. Um, to kind of illustrate this holistic supply chain approach, let me just pick on um, rare earths. And so the basic process, of course, is you have an ore, you need to, you need to separate the mineral from, from the rock or the gang, and you do that through flotation processes. Often you have to roast and then leach, extract the elements of desired, and then go through a concentration process. And so we develop a series of projects around this pathway, um, everything from developing uh, computational approaches um, that are enhanced with AI and ML to, to really design new ligands for improved separations. Um, we then take those into the lab, synthesize them, validate that indeed they, they are, uh, validate those predictions. Um, we apply them to different separation techniques. In this particular case, membrane-based separations has proven to be um, quite effective um, for rare earths, both in the upstream activities as well as recycling. One of the holy grails is rather than leaching everything um, all at once, can we go in and selectively dis dissolve the rare earths that we want? Um, if you're familiar with the rare earths, there are the three and maybe four magnetic rare earths. That's what drives the economy of rare earths um, is, is the magnets. So neodymium, praseodymium, their neighbors, their light rare earths, and then dysprosium and terbium, too heavy. Um, no reason to go in and extract any of the others. We just need those four, and that's going to be the most economical process. And then finally, can we eliminate harsh chemicals? And we've developed an acid-free dissolution um, to recover rare earth magnets from electronic waste. Um, so all of these kind of combine in a way that, um, that can address um, the diversifying supply and driving reuse and recycling. I think I might just skip um, this slide. Um, it does go into a little bit about the way we are designing new uh, ligands and new molecules for both extraction, flotation, extraction, and separation. Um, clearly what we are trying to, to strive is to uh, take advantage of various design principles from that, that affect selectivity, efficiency, solubility, as well as stability. In the end, as I said, we come up with extractants that are um, more effective um, with separation factors two to three times over existing extractants. This glycol amide extractant has been licensed by Marshallton Research Laboratories. Um, uh, I see my slide is old too. They are scaling up the commercial synthesis. And in fact, um, they are getting interest uh, from a number of our other team members for kilogram quantities. So this is um, uh, for testing in solvent extraction uh, uh, flow sheets. So this is exciting. Um, we're also looking at the direct um, alternative ways to, to refine rare earth oxides to metals and magnet alloys, preferably along routes that require less uh, energy, low temperature. Um, most of the rare earths are produced by electrochemical molten salt processes. And um, we're looking at new, more continuous uh, thermal metallic reduction methods. And again, um, tested out at the laboratory, now being developed by Purvis uh, uh, Corporation uh, at the 10 kilogram batch scale. We also develop alternatives. In this case, it's a neodymium magnet, but it has um, about 25% lanthanum substituted for the neodymium. So about 25% reduction in the critical rare earth. We do have to add a little bit of cobalt just to compensate. Lanthanum is not one of those magnetic rare earths. But Western Digital is quite interested in, in evaluating the use uh, of, of this alternative reduced critical rare earth magnet for, for use in their hard drives. Western Digital also, as many of the tech companies, 
are concerned about the end of life. And so they, they come to us looking for better ways for recycling and disposition of their hard drives. How do they get, um, uh, how can they be good stewards, even if they're not doing the recycling themselves, but how do, how do they ensure that their materials uh, and, and their products are being managed responsibly? And finally, um, as I mentioned, the acid-free method. This has actually been licensed by uh, a local company here in Iowa. Um, they're putting the finishing touches on a pilot plant operation, about 8,000 kilogram batch size. So this is taking mostly hard drives, which are crushed and shredded for data security reasons. And this acid-free method, very selective, goes in, just removes the rare earth, anything rare earth, dissolves away, it leaves the aluminum, the steel, the precious metals, um, the plastic, everything else intact, and that can be normally recycled um, and, and for the copper, for the steel. Um, so it's a very nice process. Um, we use the same approach to do the batteries. Um, and, and so, um, we do look for diversifying the sources for lithium and cobalt. Um, lithium kind of comes in two varieties, at least two varieties that we worry about. One are hard rock sources and the other are aqueous brines or produced waters. And, um, and we've developed methods. Well, we've analyzed what are the technical barriers for these sources to be really developed. And for hard rock sources, it's, um, it has to do with the, uh, well, I have a slide, I'll, I'll come back to that. For the brines and produced waters, it's the effective um, uh, separation of lithium, usually from sodium and potassium, which is also contained in these brines. So we've developed sorbents um, to, to effectively absorb the lithium and then to delithiate that uh, on demand and, and concentrate it actually through a forward osmosis membrane process. Um, we're also looking at electrochemical recovery of cobalt from cobaltite. Um, the issue there actually has to do with uh, the arsenic and how do you sequester the arsenic. The sorbents have been extended now, um, not just to aqueous brines, um, but to a um, uh, tailings. There are lots and lots of tailings across the country. Um, in this particular uh, site, um, it's the boron mine tailings that has a rather high concentration of lithium. And taking the lessons we learned from the sorbates, we've been able to develop a, a sorbate based on gibbsite. And it's very effective in selectively uh, removing lithium from the solvate sulfate-based leachate solution um, and, and, and concentrating that. And so the real question was, did the sorbents uh, we developed for brines, which is typically chloride chemistry, will they work in sulfate? And we've been able to, to do that. Coming back to the, the, the hard rock, uh, we, we, the United States, have a number of, of spotamine hard rock deposits in the southeast of the country, Tennessee, North Carolina. And really the technical gap there is, is you have to take the rock and you have to roast it um, in order for, for the lithium uh, mineral to be leachable. And so, so we've, taken an approach that basically allows for a room temperature extraction, actually conversion through a mechanical chemical means to take the spotamine and transform it from the low temperature alpha spotamine to a leachable form of spotamine that usually requires this 1100 degrees um, uh, heat treatment. Furthermore, the spotamine um, that is so the mechanical chemical approach not only transforms it to a leachable, but then a, a variety, but also can perform the chemistry to, to convert it directly to the either the carbonate or the hydroxide. 
and so we get rid of the acid and caustic, caustic acid or caustic leach steps. So lots of process intensification here. And um, the latest report just this month was we were achieving 83% extraction of the lithium that's present um, in, in just a few months after we initiated the project. So, so this is holding lots of process or uh, lots of uh, potential. Um, we, we were connected with a uh, uh, Piedmont Lithium as a partner in this, and they will be evaluating this um, for their newly awarded uh, uh, demonstration facility. When it comes to recycling, um, we've been teaming with Retrieve. Actually, they've been recently brought out by Zebra. So um, we team with them. Um, they were still, from a commercial standpoint, um, the conversion of these batteries is directly to black mass. Um, that's where you take the batteries and you're grinding it. You produce this, this black mass, literally. And, um, and we've been trying to take the hydrometallurgical approach of leaching, separating, and then producing high purity salts. Um, and we've been looking at ways to combine these three uh, steps to be able to reduce the um, uh, energy intensity of the process. One example of this is, uh, again, the membrane solvent extraction. It was developed for rare earths, but it's equally applicable to, to the black mass. And we can develop a three-stage process where we can separate the cobalt and the manganese from nickel and lithium in the first stage. The second stage separates cobalt and manganese, and the third stage separates nickel from aluminum. So again, um, you know, we're taking it all the way back to the elements, but we produce four independent um, um, liquors of lithium, nickel, manganese, and cobalt. Um, we can also try to apply electrochemical assisted leaching um, in this process, and we've had some excess. The electrochemical leaching allows us to remove iron, aluminum, and zinc. Um, by inserting a stage zero um, part of this process. So this, this technology has been licensed by Momentum Technology and they recently received an investment to build a recycling facility. Um, they have, they actually licensed the, rare, the technology to do rare earth recycling and they found they couldn't find enough hard drives enough sources of magnets to be able to make that profitable. So they turned to the batteries and, and clearly um, the opportunity is there and that's what they're pursuing. So sometimes, again, the innovation is met for one thing, but it finds a different use depending on the situation. Um, we too try to understand um, the uh, impact of, of the different processes um, so this is a life cycle analysis of this electrochemical enhanced leaching process um, where we use iron uh, as a reductant in the process to assist leaching. Um, the alternative is to use peroxide. That's what's used today. So a hydrogen peroxide based leaching method. So um, with EC leach, we attain the same sort of leaching capabilities, but we see that, um, that the number of factors are reduced significantly. For example, global, global warming potential is reduced by 90%, um, greater than 60% in, in all categories. In addition to LCA, we also do TEA um, to ensure that, that at least the bottom line um, projections of bottom line are consistent with something that um, um, can lower costs over existing techniques. So in a similar way, our technology is, is, is getting out there. Um, as mentioned, um, uh, the sorbents are being considered for, for produced waters uh, from oil gas uh, production. 
a company uh, called Lesos has, has actually licensed a bundle of technology to recover lithium from produced waters. Um, we've been working with Rio Tinto Boron on the mine tailings from their borate processes. Uh, Exergy has licensed this technology that re allows the recovery of high purity lithium and manganese salts from waste batteries um, using a, a water, uh, DMS, DME dewatering precipitation scheme and Quantum Ventura is piloting CMI technologies. Um, a, a process called e-recovery, um, again, electrochemical assisted recovery. Um, in that case, it was developed mostly with platinum group metals in mind, but it is also effective in recovering rare earth and battery materials from e-waste. And with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Tom. Uh, excellent um, presentation. Uh, to all of those uh, in the virtual world, uh, you can raise your virtual hand. Um, otherwise, uh, if you're not in the virtual world and you're in the room, uh, then Amy uh, will uh, sort of let me know um, that, that you're ready. Um, I kind of wanted to get us started um, kind of thinking about um, basically, you know, you talked, you know, quite a bit about uh, sort of separations um, for sort of I guess, uh, handling non-earth abundant uh, materials. Um, but what are the promising sort of abundant and domestically sourced energy materials right now? Well, lithium is certainly one of the more abundant domestically available uh, uh, critical materials. Of course, rare earths are, are ubiquitous. Uh, we have the Mountain Pass mine uh, in California. It's one of the best grade uh, uh, ores, uh, it's a bastonite ore, um, and, and that's, that is leading to the, the current production of um, roughly 40,000 metric tons. Actually, their tailing piles is the second best and perhaps the world's best tailing pile. Um, it contains two to 3% of bastonite um, as well as monazite. Um, uh, for the rare earths, monazite is usually the, uh, the secondary ore. Um, it's frowned upon a bit because it tends to carry the radioactive uh, components. And so it often ends up in the tailing piles. Uh, we have mineral sands um, in the Southeast for rare earths. Um, they typically run about 500 parts per million. Those sands are more uh, titanium and zirconium bearing, sometimes yttrium. Some have scandium. Um, and then there's what you might consider the unconventional sources. So phosphate uh, mining um, has about the same levels of rare earths. Uh, the red mud that comes from aluminum mining also has uh, maybe about 100 ppm, ppm rare earths. And then coal and coal byproducts uh, continue to be a source, particular fly ash. Uh, it, it ranges between tens of ppm to hundreds of ppm. Um, each each of those unconventional source brings its own challenge. Yeah. Right. Of course. Of course. Um, just to continue on, Idaho is cobalt, um, but it's tied up typically with arsenic, so we have a, a, a sequestration concern or a valorization concern. How do we make use of the arsenic? Um, could be gallium arsenide. Um, and there are, there is an operating nickel mine in the upper peninsula and uh, a potential mine in northern Minnesota for nickel, uh, along with nickel oh, comes cobalt and platinum group metals. So there's an, there's a spattering of some of these around the country. Um, really the question is how do you open it up uh, responsibly? Right, right. Okay, I'm not sure exactly who uh, raised their hand first, so I apologize if if I'm doing this in the wrong order, but Jennifer? Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, is there one step that is the most energy intensive uh, step in all of these extraction recovery processes? Um, being a particle technology pers person, I know grinding has to precede many of these. Is it that or is it does it vary with the process? Um, in general, roasting um, 
if roasting isn't the most um, energy intensive, then it's, it's metal production, because basically you're reversing what mother nature has done naturally, and that's you know, convert it to an oxide or a sulfide. Um, I think communition um, of the ore, um, breaking it down into particle sizes that are suitable for flotation is probably next. Um, it's hard to say the amount of uh, in separations, it depends probably on the material strain. So rare earths, you don't get a, a large separation factor. Um, typically 1.2 to 1.5. So, um, so you can imagine these stages and, and like at Mountain Pass, it's a football field long or two um, set of separation stages. And so you got lots of inventory, lots of pumps, lots of um, uh, running. And that's why these new agents, uh, separation uh, ligands, uh, even if they double, uh, their, their efficiency, they take half the number of stages. So you have half the capital investment, half the inventory of chemicals and half the operating costs. So, so that's, that's really the holy grail, isn't it? Yeah. Better separations improves everything. Thank you. Okay, Scott. We can't hear you, Scott. Okay, I hope it's just me, but I can't hear you, Scott. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Oh, all right. Tom, I, uh, you're a uh, little, when you mentioned arsenic, so my son goes to school in the Upper Peninsula. There are a lot of contaminated lakes from uh, tailings. I well, assume it sounds it's arsenic. Like, sounds like Houghton, Michigan. That's where he goes. Yeah, he goes yeah. to college and it's beautiful, but there are contaminated lakes because of the copper tailings. Yes. Does our pursuit of all of these rare earth metals and the extraction, does it concentrate other things that have to be dealt with? And is there any technical challenges of the tailings that we have to be dealing with as well? Excellent question. Um, there are. Um, for rare earths, it has mostly to do with the um, the rad materials, uranium and thorium. Um, and, and one has to be careful because if you concentrate them above, I'm pretty sure it's 0.1%, then it becomes a source material and you're regulated by the NRC. Um, mining is regulated enough, you don't need the NRC coming in. So, so one has to be careful. Now, there is one mitigation outlet and that's a company, Energy Fuels. They are a uranium mill operating in Southern Utah. And they have begun to process um, rare earth ores from mineral sands. Um, in fact, their license requires them to have a certain level of radioactivity. So, so, they're, so they announced recently their trifecta. They took mineral sands, they were able to recover uranium, vanadium and the rare earths. And so good value uh, proposition for them. Um, but yeah, the, um, the question becomes, how do you valorize some of these materials, the nickel mines um, in Northern Minnesota and near Marquette, Michigan um, are sulfur based. One quickly goes to the thought fertilizers, right? And, and maybe, converting that into something useful um, there. Um, the arsenic is challenging. Yeah. So these minor components, we do have to pay attention to, Scott. You're absolutely right. I went to Michigan Tech, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's go on to Gerald. Hi, Tom. Uh, congrats. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. A congratulation uh, after the Anariel talk. It's amazing what interdisciplinary team can do and how you bring different teams feeding each other. So that's terrific. In this spirit, I, I have a question of curiosity. Um, do we think that 
bio processes could play a role at one point in time. I mean, the microbiome, the biofermentation, bioremediation is really exploding. It was a bit absent from an Ariel and uh, from your talk, but you are so interdisciplinary. Do you see uh, some areas where it could help mitigate? You know, we see a lot of acid and caustic and mechanochemistry looks like still very, very, <laughs> very robust. Any comments on that, Tom? Yeah, I, I, I admit I had to make some choices. We have a fairly active program in bio-inspired approaches. Um, it could be microorganisms that um, actually uh, consume rare earths and concentrate them. Um, it could be microorganisms that um, uh, produce uh, mild acids and that are typically used for heat bleaching. Uh, which is commercial for, for copper and gold type to, uh, uh, re uh, recovery. But we've shown that indeed all of these methods work for the rare earths. Um, they're, they're not fast. Um, and, and, and so improvements on reaction rates, um, they are nice and uh, uh, we'll call it mild acids. One of the approaches we've seen um, with a bio lixivient um, has been um, uh, an organism called gluco, uh, gluconobacter, and it produces gluconic acid. Um, we first ran across this organism. Um, and it was fairly effective at rare earths. We did the TEA. We found out that the most important uh, cost was the sugar to feed it. Um, this was done by a team of uh, at Idaho and at Ames, so Idaho and a Iowa. So we turned to food waste products, so potato wastewater and corn stover. And sure enough, the bugs thrived on that. So we, we made it use of a waste product um, to feed these bugs. But then as we dug into it deeper, it turns out that it's not, that the biolixiviant actually does better than just pure gluconic acid. So there's, there's another factor that comes into play um, with the, 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 the organism that allows it to chelate some of the rare earths in addition to just leaching. And so, that's a good thing for extraction. It may be a little more challenging to then have it release the rare earth when you want it to be released. And then the final um, area is proteins. Uh, in particular, we found a protein uh, called LAN modulin um, that uh, ends up um, being a good attractor for rare earths. Um, again, you know. It's not extremely efficient, but, but it, is, it is renewable in that sense. And we're figuring out how to best build scaffolds and, you know, and, and utilize this protein. Um, wide open field. Um, we haven't even begun to maybe design or optimize some of those proteins. Um, um, and so going forward, we're looking at maybe bringing some computational um, and design, um, high throughput computational design efforts to, to maybe um, design more selective. Again, it, for the rare earths, it's about being selective. If we can just get a single rare earth out of a mixture um, and enhance that, then, then we don't have to go down the, the series, right? So, yeah, sorry, just didn't have a lot of time to include many of the different approaches we've been looking at. But clearly it's in your consideration set, so that's Absolutely. great. Absolutely, yeah. Shodi, uh, we're at time, so do you have a quick question? Um, I think I just have a quick comment, which is um, we are learning so much from uh, separations from critical materials and it looks like it can be translated to lithium ion batteries. And um, it, it looks like one of the limiting factors in, in, in all of this is, is the separation process and the environmental impact of the separation process. 
the cost of that process. And um, separations is a is a major cornerstone of chemical engineering. So I do think that um, there is a you know there is a contribution um, here uh, for uh, for this board. So that's just my comments. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Judy. Jody. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Amy, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Shelly. And thank you, Tom. That was a great talk. Um, so we're going to take a short five minute break and then come back for the last presentation of this afternoon's session. So let's aim for 2.05, uh, 4.05. Sorry, wrong time zone. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, our the closing talk of this session is going to be presented by Dr. George Crabtree, who's a member of the National Academy of Science. Um, George is the director of the Joint Center for Energy Storage, J. Caesar, which is the Department of Energy Battery Hub centered at Argonne National Lab. He's also a distinguished professor of physics, electrical, and mechanical engineering at the University of Illinois at Chicago. So George has really led. Jay Caesar now, I guess, almost a decade um, and really pushed more of the, the combined science and engineering side of new innovations and in energy storage. So we've heard a lot about, I would say, some of the more engineering, economic modeling side of things. And now George is going to talk about um, opportunities for chemistry in energy storage for climate change. So with that, thank you, George. I'll turn it over to you. Can you hear me, first of all? You can. OK. Uh, thank you, Amy. Wonderful intro. And um, I will talk a little bit about JC's direction. I'm going to focus more on opportunities. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about anything. And the discussion has been excellent, I think, today. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I was planning to talk. Let me get my laser pointer up here um, about these things, a little bit about climate change, because that's what's driving energy storage right now. The fact that we lack about half the commercial technology that we need to decarbonize, says here by 2050, but by any year. Uh, and I would like to propose electrochemistry, uh, both for its applications in batteries, where's the next generation battery? We've already talked that we can't do everything with lithium ion, so we're gonna need some more. Uh, and then the last point, uh, decarbonizing industry with electrochemistry. That's a bit of a far out notion, but it might be something that, that really has merit and we ought to start thinking about now. So first, a couple of words about the changing energy landscape. Go back to 2012, if you can remember that far back. Uh, it was all personal electronics and it was all lithium ion. Uh, and lithium ion did everything, laptops, iPads, cell phones, everything you could think of. Uh, and uh, so that sort of formed our thinking we realized that it wouldn't be perfect for say electric vehicles or the electricity grid, but we thought there could be a single next generation battery that is perfect for EVs and the electricity grid. We estimated uh, that it would take about five times the energy density and one fifth the cost to, uh, to realize this vision. Then 2015, along come the Paris Accords. There was finally international agreement that we have to do something about climate change, quantitative goals that we all know about. Uh, and as I mentioned, we uh, I'll have another slide on this. We lack a, about half the commercial technology. That means there was an urgent need for discovery and innovation to get all the technology we need. And now it's 2022. If you look at the cost of lithium ion, it's come down by more than a factor of five in the last 10 years. So suddenly it get it qualifies for some things. And in particular, we've already talked about it's viable for cars, passenger EVs, and for four hour grid storage, because that's as long as lithium ion can discharge at full power. Uh, but it's not viable for the heavier duty transportation like rail or marine shipping or aviation. You need a better, higher energy density battery for that. And it's not good for multi-day grid storage. So there are two examples of uh, applications gaps that cannot be filled by lithium ion. So here's the revised energy storage vision. It's a diversity of batteries for a diversity of uses. 
design the battery for the application instead of taking one battery and trying to use it for every application. And the corollary to that is we need this, a predictive understanding of electrochemical phenomena at atomic and molecular levels so we can, as this uh, visual here says, so we can build batteries from the bottom up. We start with the atoms that we need. We know how they're gonna react. We know what they're gonna produce. Uh, and we put in the things we need to produce the overall behavior for that battery, be it high energy density, long duration discharge or whatever. We, sh we will be able to get transformative materials and chemistries and architectures that we haven't seen before. The nice thing about this is it serves all application needs. So tell me your need. This is the vision of the future. Tell me your need, I'll design a battery for you. Um, so here's a little bit about lacking half the commercial technology. This report came out about a year and a half ago from IEA, and uh, it plotted how uh, every sector here uh, could decarbonize by 2050. And it looks pretty easy when you just look at this graph. Oh, we'll reduce everything. We'll eventually get there. It's actually dramatically different, difficult. So for example, one of the marks on this graph by 2030, we have to put in four times as much solar and wind as we did in 2020. And 2020 was a banner year for that record breaking year. And we have to do that every year from 2030 to 2050. That's pretty tough to do. Uh, some of the other things here by 2035, 100% of personal car sales have to be electric. Uh, might come close to that, but 50% of the heavy truck sales have to be electric and that we don't know how to do. So uh, this, this actually uh, influential report, I think, has been verified by others who come to the same conclusion. Here are the things we have. So we can roll out solar cells, we can roll out wind, uh, we can roll out batteries, at least lithium ion batteries. We can electrify buildings and we can electrify personal cars. It's clear that we can do that. Commercial te technology exists. The challenge is to roll it out fast, as uh, really at challenging rates. Here's the things we don't have. We don't have the advanced batteries that we need for, uh, well, let's look at the, at the applications. Manufacturing, cement, steel, plastics, chemicals, agriculture and land use where it's very different. It's not really fossil fuel use. It's in the case of land use, fossil fuel or carbon dioxide uh, absorption and storing. But in the case of agriculture, it's the plants and animals that produce actually different greenhouse gases, not carbon dioxide, but methane and nitrous oxide that we have to know how to stop. So this, we just haven't thought about enough. And here's the heavy duty transportation down here. We don't have those things. So this report identified three areas, advanced batteries, green hydrogen and direct air capture, technologies that we basically have to invent. Here's the situation for heavy duty transportation. So IEA also about a year before the previous report, these are the emissions, the carbon dioxide emissions. And you see as a function of time, again, it's a roadmap to decarbonize. Passenger cars are about half of the emissions, carbon, carbon dioxide emissions from transportation. It's trucks, shipping, aviation, and other things that make up the other half. So EVs can work for passenger cars. Probably as you go up this chain, uh, get heavier duty, they work less and less well. And we need some technologies there. There are some uh, options. So you could have high energy density batteries that would be like lithium oxygen, for example, which has maybe five times the energy density of lithium ion. We're not there yet. It's quite a long ways off. You could use fuel cells. And there is a battle now with uh, semi trucks. Should they be fuel cells? Should they be, um, uh, should be, they be battery? And uh, something that's even farther out, a carbon-free chemical energy carrier that is not a fossil fuel. And we have two examples, green hydrogen or another version of hydrogen, ammonia NH3, which has the advantage you can liquefy it and uh, send it off, transport it through pipes. Or maybe there are some new materials that ultimately will replace fossil fuels as chemical energy carriers and say a little bit more about that later. Uh, if you look at the electricity grid, so we looked at heavy duty transportation, how about the electricity grid? 
Well, we have a lot of chemical storage on the electricity grid now. We use uh, natural gas in peaker plants, store it underground seasonably because we know in cold climates, we're gonna need that for heating. Uh, and, uh, get rid of that. Um, and, uh, uh, and we have to worry mostly about the demand. We're trying to satisfy demand, which is variable. In tomorrow's grid, if it's renewable, it will be the supply as well as the demand. So overcast days, uh, calm days. Uh, and you could use batteries for some of that, as we said, but you may need carbon uh, free chemical storage. So what are the applications? Well, intraday passing clouds, you can reduce the uh, output of solar panels by 70% while the cloud passes over. Clearly you need a battery and it could be lithium ion that takes care of the uh, seconds to hours variations. Cost of lithium ion now is about $140 a kilowatt hour, uh, but that won't work for multi-day overcast uh, or calm days. Maybe historically 10 consecutive days in a row, it happens fairly frequently. You may need the next generation battery and DOE has already established a target for that get the cost down by a factor of 10. So it's got to come down to $14 a kilowatt hour. Big challenge, although there are opportunities there. And then there's seasonal demand, and partly because the supply changes. In winter, the sun is low. There's less sunlight, less daylight. So you just have less solar energy there. Uh, and of course, there's the demand uh, variation seasonally, depending on you're in a cold climate or in you're in a warm climate. So you probably need some chemical energy storage for this because batteries will discharge over a six month time period. Uh, and it could be molten salt thermal storage, or again, something that's not a fossil fuel, but that is a chemical energy storage medium for, uh, you know, that's, uh, that doesn't have any carbon in it. So those are two of the, of the examples of two things that require something beyond lithium ion. But the supply chain itself is a challenge as we've been talking about all along. Um, and lithium ion has just about the opposite supply chain you want. It's expensive, the materials are expensive, they're earth limited and it's an international supply chain. And this illustrates visually what we've already said today that a lot of it comes from China somewhere maybe 60 to 80% of battery materials are refined in China. They're not necessarily sourced there, but it's a bottle, a potential bottleneck in the supply chain. So you'd like to have an alternative. And the aspiration is here, make it inexpensive, make it earth abundant, make it domestic. And there are, there are batteries that will do that. For example, metal air batteries or multivalent batteries with magnesium, calcium, zinc, aluminum, two or three electrons per, uh, per ion you get two or three times the energy density uh, in principle from that. So um, here, interesting graph here or table, iron air, aluminum air, zinc air, lithium air, they're all candidates. You can look at the operating voltage, that's interesting. Here's the practical energy net density and for iron air, it's rather low for lithium ion, practical energy density might be about 300 watt hours per kilogram. So you see aluminum is higher, zinc is higher. Lithium air is really high. It's a sense, you know, a significant fraction of fossil fuel. Uh, and here's the cost. And it's pretty low for iron, as you might expect, pretty high for lithium just because lithium is expensive. But these are things that uh, we need to think about. How do we do that? Uh, and I, as we were saying earlier, you could imagine that some of these batteries uh, with the very favorable supply chains could replace lithium ion in some of the applications that it's used for now, be just because lithium ion is, is too expensive. So what are some of the solutions? And this is a bit technical, but here's lithium ion. It has a graphite intercalation anode. It has a liquid organic electrolyte and it has an intercalation cathode of transition metals, NMC, uh, which is also an intercalation uh, process. So it's intercalation on both sides, anode and cathode. Well, you could replace graphite with lithium metal, 
Uh, and by the way, when you intercalate uh, graphite to its maximum amount, you get one lithium for every six carbons. So you get one seventh of the atoms doing storing energy for you. If you had a pure lithium metal atom, every atom would be storing energy for you. So you'd get the energy density up. You might have a liquid or a solid electrolyte. Solid electrolyte would make the battery much safer. And if you pair it with a, with a metal anode, uh, you'll get a higher energy density. And typically you wanna keep the intercalation cathode. And here are some examples of what's around. The next step up is to get rid of the intercalation cathode, use what's called a conversion cathode. Typically, typical example, sulfur and oxygen. You could have a liquid or a solid electrolyte, but with the conversion cathode, again, every atom in that cathode is storing or releasing energy for you. So it's the same argument that you have on the anode side. So we've done a lot with lithium ion, of course. And that means uh, except for the metal anode, this part of the battery would be the same in, in this uh, configuration here. This is the most radical, get rid of the intercalation uh, electrode on both sides. And we've done far less here. This is a huge, I think, opportunity to develop, to develop the science, the technology of how to build these batteries and how to recharge them. So there's another option, and that is the so-called redox flow batteries, where instead of solid electrodes, you have liquid electrodes. These have been around for a long time. They've always been too expensive. They're, they're already commercial in terms of vanadium redox flow batteries, um, but they haven't caught on uh, commercially, partly because the expense is so high. So we can look at this as another frontier that we ought to be developing. Um, but it's not just batteries. We talked before about hydrogen and fuel cells. This is like a fuel cell is like a battery with no electrodes. So hydrogen comes in one side, oxygen comes in the other side. Electrochemically, you react them, you produce water. And in the electrochemical process, you have to have electrons flowing. They flow through an external circuit and that's the fuel cell. A lot of advantages there are much lighter weight. Or back to our carbon-free energy carriers, uh, we have hydrogen, we have, we have ammonia at the moment. They both have their downsides uh, and neither one is anywhere near as versatile as fossil fuels. So hydrocarbons, you've got methane, you've got propane, you've got butane, you've got gasoline, you've got diesel, you've got jet fuel all different forms of hydrocarbons that you custom design for the application. That's something you really can't do with at least these two energy carriers. There's another one called liquid organic hydrogen carriers. And the idea here is you take carbon rings and uh, you take double bonds in this case, uh, convert them to single bonds and that releases three hydrogens in this benzene ring. Uh, so you don't, you don't really wanna burn the liquid organic hydrogen carrier, it's just a carrier, but you can extract hydrogen from it and then use the hydrogen in a fuel cell or for combustion. So those are the options. And I think we've already emphasized this slide often enough. It's not just the battery, it's the supply chain and it's the application. So you wanna look for an application that you gotta have, it's a killer application, you wanna make a battery that is designed to that application and you wanna make sure that the supply chain for that battery is inexpensive, earth abundant and domestic. That's, you have to look at the whole ecosystem. Um, I thought I would spend a little time talking about some of these frontiers uh, at a more atomic and molecular level. Uh, and the first frontier I'd like to talk about is salvation. Why? because it controls nearly all the static and dynamic electrochemistry of batteries. So you imagine uh, a lithium ion coming in off the anode. It suddenly goes into solution, surrounds itself with solvent molecules. That uh, cluster, that salvation gel, moves through the liquid um, electrolyte over to the cathode. It has to desolvate and the lithium ion has to react with whatever's in the cathode. So it really controls almost everything. 
And of course, there are solids, liquids, glasses, and polymers that you could put in there. So this is really a very broad field. Uh, there is, I've called it here, redox mirror design. I have in mind uh, flow batteries. And instead of vanadium, which is kind of limited in what it can do and kind of expensive, how about organic molecules where you can design the molecule to do what you want, to make that flow battery do what you want? So do you want a high energy density? Well, make the molecule more soluble. Uh, do you want it to self-repair? So when some of the uh, organic molecules degrade, that you just cut them off and replace them. And especially if it's on an oligomer backbone, you cut off the bad ones and you replace them with good ones. So there's a, the idea here, there's a huge design space. And if you can make it cheap enough, then you can, um, you can actually make the redox flow battery, let's say, bring it to a practical level. And the third one is multivalent ion materials design. That's magnesium, calcium, and zinc. Working ions, they advantage, they have two electrons per ion. So you could on each reaction get twice. You actually don't usually achieve fully twice, but more uh, energy density than you get with lithium ion. And they have the advantage, they're much more earth abundant and cheap. Probably the most uh, promising one right now is zinc. It's the farthest along the path. Uh, and you could imagine zinc in water electrolytes. So water's the cheapest electrolyte you can think of uh, with the right cathodes that are cheaper, safer, and um, would replace some of the lithium ion applications that we have now. So these are the three places. And in Salvation, there is now, Jay Caesar is working on this, um, a unified framework for salvation and transport in liquid and solid electrolytes. So liquids, glasses, crystals, and polymers. Uh, and not to go into the details, but if we could uh, bring this to maturity, it would give a uniform way of looking at all electrolytes and selecting the right one for a given battery application much more straightforwardly than we do now. Uh, there's another breakthrough in salvation and that's high concentration we think of, as I was saying earlier, a isolated lithium coming off the anode being surrounded by solvent molecules as the solvation shell and moving over to the cathode. But if you put uh, many more lithium ions in there, so that means the, there's not enough solvent, they have to be shared in neighboring solvation shells. And that makes this uh, concentrated uh, electrolyte a collective system. It's not isolated lithiums acting alone. It's, it's, uh, it has to be collective. They have very different properties than the, than the isolated limit. And we're just finding out what those are. If you go to even more concentration, you find remarkably and surprisingly phase separation in the, in, uh, the solution. And it's, it's, if it's water, it's water, um, uh, dominant, uh, they're actually on the nanoscale, so we call them nanoscale aggregates, but some are water dominant, dominant, some are anion dominant. And these have, again, very different properties that we might be able to exploit for, um, for the next generation battery. There are also some very incisive new experiments, in particular, electrophoretic NMR, which when combined with molecular dynamics calculations gives you the velocity of every molecule in that electrolyte, the anions, the cations, the solvent. Uh, and this is a level of information really at the atomic level that we haven't had before. So this, this will be very useful, for example, in filling out this unified framework uh, for salvation and transport um, across all the, uh, all the materials classes. The second one is X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy, that's XPCS. Uh, it tells you the velocity everywhere in the cell of the solvent, and you can imply with molecular dynamics calculations what happens to the lithium as well. The interesting thing here is that it depends on coherent X-rays, and at the ALS and the APS at Berkeley and Argonne, both are being upgraded, so the coherent fraction of x-rays will go way up. In the case of the APS, it'll go up by a factor of 100. 
that means for XPCS, it depends on the square of that um, coherent fraction. So that's going to go up the sensitivity by a factor of 10,000. So when those upgrades become available in probably three years, maybe a little less, uh, suddenly we'll be able to do this experiment at much higher levels. So there are ways both uh, computationally and experimentally to explore solvation. Interestingly, in, with, for flow batteries, the trick is to find out of the vast white space of, uh, of, of possible organic molecules, the ones you want. And you, it's, it's too big for the human brain, but you can use uh, artificial intelligence. So starting in 2014, there was a techno-economic paper published that compared organic electrolytes with water electrolytes and asked which ones are gonna be the favored ones. And remarkably, that TEA analysis uh, said, well, depending on where you work in, in your design space, they can be equally attractive economically and for performance. So that set off, and again, this is Jay Caesar work, but that set off uh, uh, a whole time sequence set from 2015 till now of using AI to, to find analytes and catholytes, as they're call, called, with the properties you want. And they've, they've gotten steadily better. For example, uh, uh, the solubility went up with this particular, um, I guess this is a catholyte, 2019. Here in, also in 2019, the first 3.2 volt uh, all organic flow battery. And we thought that was difficult. We now have our eye, our eye on four volt batteries. So you can get the voltage range up. Uh, and here's um, preventing crossover and degradation in 2020. Latest thing, 2022, it's an oligomer with redox active organic molecules on the backbone you can identify which ones of those molecules have degraded, gone bad with a fluorescent signal. And then that's the first step to say, well, I'll, I'll cut that uh, link to the backbone and replace that molecule with something else. And we've learned how to cut the link. We haven't learned yet how to replace the molecule, but that's the next step. So this is a really promising direction and it would bring a whole new category of next generation battery uh, into, into play. Uh, with multivalent, uh, the trick with multivalent is, unfortunately, for calcium and magnesium and zinc and so on, none of the anode, none of the electrolytes and none of the cathodes that work for lithium ion will work for these multivalent materials. So it's a matter of rediscovering almost everything. They all uh, exploit uh, a pure metal anode. So it would be magnesium, calcium, or zinc as a pure metal. But the question is the electrolyte and the cathode. But uh, starting the discovery process again, here are uh, two cathodes, iron phosphate, which we did use for lithium. Uh, that also works for calcium, but what works even better is this uh, vanadium phosphate, which, uh, uh, gets near three volts and uh, stores a lot more uh, calcium. There also is a lot of progress on the electrolyte, again, for calcium batteries. This is an organic one, works at uh, room temperature with an anodic stability of, of four volts. So there are plenty of opportunities here to, to make the next generation multivalent battery. And when it comes to zinc, it's really a question of the water electrolyte. That's the cheapest one. And remarkably, looking at a lithium battery here, but in concentrated water electrolytes, this happens to be lithium, TFSI, and a, a separate cation, this organic cation, which is put in as a supporting salt, which does two things. For one thing, it doubles the solubility of lithium TFSI, so suddenly you can get a lot more in. And it raises, as this diagram shows, uh, the, the voltage window for electrolysis. It goes from 1.23 to 3.25 um, 
uh, volts. So you get a much uh, higher operating range. If you do the same thing for zinc, so that's this uh, with a different anion, and of course a different cation, it, it raises the solubility, but it also um, sort of forces the reaction for a protective layer. It has zinc uh, sulfate in it, it has zinc uh, carbonate a cup and zinc fluoride, a couple of other things. We don't know too much more about it other than its composition, but this transmits zinc, but nothing else, no electrons, and enables uh, very high efficiency stripping and plating across the zinc electrode. So this is very promising for a zinc ion battery. Um, I think I won't say too much about artificial intelligence, but clearly simulation and artificial intelligence are very important if you want to know what's going on at the atomic and molecular level. And for example, this is a, a program that was developed to calculate uh, the salvation energies of organic molecules like benzene, for example, in water, there were in this study, there were 133,000 different uh, molecules, cations that were taken as uh, examples and five different um, solvents, including water and organics for a total of 660,000 combinations. Uh, and this is the kind of thing you can do with AI and now start looking at these combinations for the, uh, for the performance that you want, designed from the bottom up. Um, I think I'll skip that one and that one. This is maybe the most interesting one. Uh, it's taking a given set of reactants and asking how many reactions can these two reactants participate in? So it's a cascade, but it's of course the products of the first reaction become the reactants of the next step in the cascade. And what do you finally end up with? And the test they looked at was, let's try to predict the SEI formation in, uh, it's just a lithium ion battery now because we know a lot about that FEI, SEI. And indeed, they were able to predict what you would get out and verify it with what we already know about lithium ion batteries. So it in this particular exercise involved 6,000 different species in the cascading reactions and 4.5 million different reactions. And it's remarkable that it even came close to predicting what actually happens. But this is the kind of design from the bottom up that uh, you can explore now on the science front. Maybe in five years, you could do this on, on the applications front. So a little bit about Jay Caesar. It's a national organization. Uh, we have 20, 20 partners, six national labs, 13 universities, one private company, that's Raytheon. Uh, and we have at any time, 180 to 200 grad students, postdocs and scientists working in these 20 institutions. We do a lot of collaboration. We collaborate with 68 other US universities that are outside our partner set, 34 European universities in 11 countries. We uh, have collaborated with 14 minority serving institutions and seven uh, EPSCoR universities. So we're really uh, part of the big community. And I think that's one of the secrets to why we are able to do so much. Um, I think I'll, well, let me, let me talk about this. Uh, we talked about fossil fuels as an ideal chemical energy carrier. What would you like to replace them? Well, if you look down this list, and I won't read it, you can see what it is, but you'd like an ideal chemical energy carrier to do all this stuff. Um, and what do we have? We have hydrocarbons. So you basically, it's a CH2 chain, polymer chain. You just keep adding CH2 elements uh, to it. And you can vary the properties dramatically. Here are three examples. Um, and so this is a basic backbone for fossil fuels and for plastics like polyethylene. So uh, they're versatile, hard to beat the versatility, uh, versatility of, of hydrocarbons. They're available from fossil fuel sources. They're cheap. We actually know how to make them. And we've relied on these hydrocarbons for what? 
much more than a century as, as just our go-to chemical energy carriers. They fail on these three items. So they are not non-toxic. In fact, they're toxic. They're definitely environmentally harmful. That's climate change. And we tend to not recycle them. We burn them or something uh, and just let the products go where they go often into the atmosphere in the case of carbon dioxide. So here's the question, are there better alternatives? We've already talked about hydrogen and, and, uh, uh, and ammonia. First of all, they're not anywhere near as versatile as hydrocarbons. You've got these two things and you can't do much else with them. So you have to use these for every application. You can't design for the application. Um, trouble with hydrogen, it's low density. You can't really compress it. Because if you do, uh, you've used up so much energy that you've kind of defeated the purpose. It leaks through pipes because it's such a mo mo small molecule and it embrittles pipes. So you cannot use methane pipes for hydrogen. You'd have to start over. Um, and with, with um, ammonia, you burn it, you're gonna get uh, oxides of nitrogen, which can be actually very toxic. So there are some downsides. So the question is, what else is there? And one thing that has come out are these liquid organic hydrogen carriers. I was saying earlier, you, they're not for combustion, they're just for storing hydrogen. You take a benzene ring and you convert the double bonds into single bonds and that releases three hydrogens. You reverse the process, you can absorb those three hydrogens and store them for the next process. A Couple of interesting papers here on, on that and uh, it's getting some play. However, even this is nowhere near as versatile as fossil fuel. So my contention is we haven't yet found the right chemical energy carrier to, to decarbonize. And that is a very open, at this point, scientific question. Two more slides. One is, uh, can we make a circular carbon dioxide economy instead of letting it go off somewhere and cause climate change? Can we do something useful with it? And this is an idea for that. So you would first capture the carbon dioxide out of the air directly from the atmosphere. Usually you pass it with a large fan through some chemical agent that absorbs the CO2 and concentrates it. You heat that, uh, that uh, material, whatever it is that releases the CO2, which is then concentrated and you can do something with it. Uh, and it leaves you with air basically uh, with no carbon dioxide in it. If you take this carbon dioxide and ask, what can you do with electrochemistry? Well, you might make carbon monoxide out of it. You might make formic acid. You might make ethylene, which is the precursor to almost every plastic in the world, or you might make methane. Uh, and you would do this at basically ambient. Well, we do it now with thermochemistry and this takes high, high temperatures. If you do it with electrochemistry, you could do it at ambient conditions. And the interesting equation that kind of drives this is this one, EV equals KT, just an energy equation. If I take one electron, move it through one volt, that's equivalent to a temperature of about 12,000 degrees Kelvin. So there is plenty of energy in electrochemistry that we could, we could use, exploit, uh, to make chemical reactions work that we now do with thermal chemistry. Use temp we use, use high temperatures. So this uh, already has a, uh, sort of a, a community forming in, on the science side to, to predict and make the electrochemist, the electrocatalyst that you need to promote these reactions uh, and to get the feeds, use the feedstocks that you need for these reactions, namely CO2, you may need some hydrogen as well, uh, and uh, to make it work. So that's, I would say, a scientific vision. And here's another scientific vision, and it's for electrochemistry as well. For many things like steel, cement, uh, petrochemicals, we take fossil feedstocks, we burn fossil fuels to get the temperatures for thermochemistry, both of those produce lots of CO2 and you get these products out. You could in principle do the same thing with carbon neutral feedstocks, with renewable electricity, 
don't do it at high temperature, do it at ambient conditions with electrochemistry and produce the same products. So much farther out, but uh, something that we ought to consider. And again, there's a dedicated community out there already who is working on these things. And again, this uh, energy equation sort of tells you that this could work. So what's the challenge? It's the discovery and design of electrocatalysts. It's uh, getting selective. So most electrocatalysts will catalyze more than one reaction and that is not what you want. So you have to get the selectivity up and you probably need more than one reaction. You won't get your final product with just one electrocatalyst. You may need two or three, do them in sequence. So these are the challenges, but they're really ripe out there, I think, now for, for exploitation. Here's some examples. Uh, of course, green hydrogen, that's uh, uh, electrolysis of water, that's over here. Uh, we already know how to do that. It would replace the steam reforming of uh, methane, uh, and that we can do. Ethylene production, now done with thermochemically uh, steam cracking of ethane re requires high temperatures. Here's a recent paper from 2020 where there was an electrocatalyst found that does the same thing, taking CO2 reduction, does it at room temperature. And it's pretty good. It's maybe not quite good enough to replace this yet, but it's, it's on the path. So those are the things I wanted to cover. Thanks for listening. Questions? <laughs> Yeah, so now we'll open it up to questions. Um, I'm gonna start with the first one while people raise their hands. So George, thank you for that. That was a really big picture of you, not just of energy storage in terms of just batteries, but just innovation in terms of energy management, I'll call it. Um, what strategies do you think would help the US close the gap in competitiveness in terms of energy storage worldwide? Well, great question. So right now it's it's batteries. And clearly China and others have the advantage over the US. However, you should look at this, 10 years ago, that was not the case. China did not have the dominant battery uh, industry. It was spread, it was South Korea and, uh, and Japan and not the United States, but it was other countries. Yeah. Gradually, uh, China through my view, industrial policy, they incentivized the growth of the lithium battery industry in China. And they were, did it very strategically. I think nobody else noticed this until recently. And they had built up the supply chain they needed. That was, I think, a strategic decision they made. Um, the US typically does not have industrial policy like that. So historically, if you go back to the 20s, we did have industrial policy because we wanted, I'm sorry, the 30s, we wanted to end the depression. Yeah. In the 40s, we had plenty of industrial policy because we wanted to win World War II. So GM was not making cars, they were making airplanes. Um, then somewhere around the 60s or the 70s, we got enamored with next generation technologies, computing, uh, curing diseases and semiconductors and things like that. And we said, let's have an R&D policy will incentivize the next technologies that we might build. But we didn't incentivize it, uh, building the industrial base for those technologies. Instead, we said the government should not be picking winners and losers. We ought to let the free market do that. And competition gives you the best result. So probably true, that's right. The, the flaw that we didn't see was that other countries were having, were incentivizing industrial uh, growth. Japan started, South Korea started, then China, of course, took over. But the industries, take lithium ion, never developed in the United States. It went, went to Japan first. And it was Sony who did it. They made a business decision. They had a camcorder, the battery was too heavy, and they put in lithium ion. And that spawned lots of other things, of course. So I think, and this has started last summer, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, among others, has started to incentivize making stuff here. And you do that by first underwriting the cost of the factory, uh, at least the first few factories, and uh, subsidizing or giving a tax incentive for every 
unit that that factory produces right. and incentivizing consumers to buy that stuff. So a good example is EVs. You can now get a $7,500 credit or tax incentive if you buy it. There are also incentives to make it and incentives and loans to help the, help build the batteries. There's, a, there's also a protective element there. That incentive uh, only applies if a certain percentage of the, of the battery and the EV were made in the US. So this is a sea change and it may introduce an era of really um, incentivizing manufacturing here and it would help us catch up. Okay, I'm looking for hands and if there are none yet, I think the next question is, you, what struck me at the end of your talk was this theme of electrochemistry enabling a lot of different sciences. And so I am in, in technology development. So I'm curious about your thought of what the current state of workforce development is in the US and what opportunities do you see um, considering how you place the technology in, in context? Yeah, I think workforce is really important and maybe that hasn't gotten the attention that it needs. It's not only electrochemistry, but a workforce across the board for all the new technologies that are coming up to, uh, to mitigate climate change. Um, my own feeling is electrochemistry is due for a huge growth spurt because here's what's driving it. We've always had fossil fuels, which are inexpensive, and we've always had thermochemistry, which served all our needs. We didn't have to develop electrochemistry. But now that climate change has changed that picture and fossil fuels are, you know, they got some downsides that we have to worry about. What's this, what are we gonna, what's gonna jump in and fill those gaps? And it could be electrochemistry at taken to, let's say a much higher level. But we need to look at that workforce development. There are a few universities in the States, I, maybe it's 10 or some number like that, which really specialize in electrochemistry and they do an excellent job of teaching it. But often it's kind of buried in the, the bigger chemistry uh, curriculum uh, and probably needs more attention. So if we're really gonna be strategic and long range, we would develop, I think that, that workforce um, to a much higher degree than, than we're doing now. Uh, but those, as I've said earlier, those comments also apply to many other disciplines that are gonna be needed. And I think we do need to, to look at that. The emphasis right now is on catching up and on taking care of climate change within a certain time frame. But uh, I think we need to look a little bit more broadly than that workforce is one of the places. Next, um, Anup, would you like the next question? Yes, great talk, uh, George. And I'm going to play back your question to you, uh, which is you brought up the point, how can we design for recycle? Have you been thinking about it? Perhaps this is where we can take the lead because if you can you know, recycle a large percentage, obviously the cost comes, comes down quite a bit, not just in terms of you know, making it greener, but also you know, if you can use it multiple times, I assume lithium can be used many, many, Times, of course, it's already kind of you know being used many times in a single battery. Yeah, that's a great question, and I know in the battery field we usually think about design to recycle as the last thing, and in fact, uh, as proof of that concept, in my entire talk I didn't mention it, and uh, I probably should have, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, but I think that's the way the community thinks. You know that if we can recycle, fine. If we can't, we still want the battery because it's gonna solve other problems for us. Probably should not think that way. I mean, I, I, I think the, the analogy is uh, supply chain. Uh, go back 10 years, maybe a bit more, 15 years, we didn't think about the supply chain. We just thought about the battery. Now we're definitely thinking about the supply chain. And that's, a, that's just a, you know, a different way of thinking. Maybe need to make that happen on the recycle side too. But I, I will say that if we are able to build the battery from the bottom up, looking starting at the atomic and molecular level, we could apply that, uh, that vision. Let's design it at the atomic and molecular level to be recyclable. And if you're dealing with things that are 
earth abundant, uh, you know, inexpensive and domestic, which are the three supply chain sort of gold standard criteria, um, that may be easier to do. It's probably easier to recycle iron than it is lithium or cobalt or manganese, you know, or nickel, just because it's a common element. It's everywhere. And that means that, uh, that uh, nature has found ways to deal with it already. We just need to imitate nature. We don't have to get so fancy to go beyond nature. So I, I, I think they may go hand in hand, that if we can get these, solve the supply chain issue, we can also uh, at least address the recycling issue. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, uh, George. It's more that I take stock of one thing that you said. Uh, again, electrochemistry can have a far-reaching impact on science and innovation. And I was looking at this example of a redoxomer with AI and uh, first principle modeling, which I'm saying for my industry, you will say, wow. And what I'm taking stock is um, the field of polymers, and I'm not talking rigid polymers that are relatively easy to modelize. And I would say small molecules are also very advanced for the use of AI and all that, but there is this new field of polymer innovation that will be important, not just for the batteries, but for biodegradation, superior sustainable product, and you name it, right? So I'm just taking stock. This, is, this looks like another evidence we need maybe as a board to look at to say, what will be the power of AI and what computing power and infrastructure you needed and the talents? So that's more a question for us than for you. Um, but I do believe I look at that. That's what I was also saying. You said, you know, we invested too much in R&D in the US, not enough in the manufacturing. And we are saying we need also to take stock on what you say. Let's not go the other way where we do a lot of manufacturing. And then we say, what could be the next thing that may not be a geopolitical vulnerability, but we are missing sustainability and stuff like that. So I'm just trying to see, you know, you are inspiring us with some areas of science that maybe we as a board should stimulate the exploration. I think you raise a very good point, and I have thought about this others uh, as well, that the emphasis now is on manufacturing and let's solve problems that we need in the next 10 years. But just thinking about climate change, it's a 50 year issue, or maybe it's even more, it probably goes to 2100. So it's probably an 80 year issue. And if we get all the technologies that we need for the next 10 years, but we've ignored innovating for the following, you know, 70 years, it could look pretty bleak at that moment. So we need to find a balance. And I'm not saying that we're out of balance now. I just, I don't know if we are or not, but we want to be sure that we we're doing what we need for the next 10 years, but also for the next 30. And I, I'm at least this year, much less investment by the government in, let's say, basic science opportunities, as opposed to applications opportunities. That's very helpful. I would say for the industry where we play, let's call it the fast moving consumer good industry, we have our responsibility to, I would say, to contribute. And I would say it's not 21, it has to be in the next 10 years. So it may not be as the highest magnitude of what we yeah. need to deliver in the next 50 years, and we can debate that, but there are things that we cannot deliver that we should deliver because the research, especially this one, is not developed. So we may, may even make your point, we should start earlier rather than later. Well, and I think it's absolutely correct that industry has to do things that can be done. I mean, everybody is aware of this rule of thumb. If it costs you a dollar to discover something, it costs you $10 to scale it up to a demonstration, and it costs you $100 to make it commercial. And you don't wanna be spending that $100 on everything because there's a lot of failures. At the science level, most things are failures, you might say, at least in terms of technology that might come from them. And you'd rather find that out for a dollar than find it out for a hundred dollars. That's the opportunity. The research can be shorter, faster, and accelerated. Yeah. If we advance the computing, chemistry, whatever we call it, power, because that makes the chances of success far higher and yes. the time of development shorter. Well, and I think there it's one thing to play in the sandbox on the science side. This is fun, so let me look into it, any application. Well, I don't know. 
uh, we could be looking at the applications gaps and saying, let's find science solutions to those gaps. Because just as we do, we look at the application before we make the battery. Well, we could look at the application before we do the science and then ask, let's solve that problem. I and mean, that's historically has not been the common attitude, but it could be. And I think it's much more intentional than just doing science because it's fun. And in a way, I feel that the NSF directorate directions, I'm just mentioning that are also going into your directions. Let's do basic research, but inspired yeah. by a problem to solve or a solution application to be made. So I think the, the puck is going into this direction, hopefully. Good point. Uh, this is Hugh DeLong. Uh, I don't have access to a hand to raise uh, in my uh, government restricted uh, <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to uh, uh, indicate, George, that I thought your talk was great. Uh, I actually picked up on some things that uh, I'm not investing in right now, although I, I am investing in the bulk of what you talked about. Um, I'm even investing in the CO2 one, but I, I, I was surprised that uh, in your discussion of these science areas that uh, you were doing an interesting job of, of taking, talking about both the positives and the negatives. But, but uh, for the CO2, I didn't hear anything at all about uh, the CO2. In other words, uh, where, where are they getting the CO2? How are they getting it? Uh, can you really produce enough? Uh, I mean, I have people working in that, both in electrochemistry and photoelectrochemistry, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it more as a uh, scientific uh, curiosity than uh, it's, it's going to really result in anything because um, I don't know how they're going to get enough CO2 in order to produce the fuel that they're going to have to replace. So uh, do you have a comment on that one? Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I think at, you know, today that is definitely a true statement. Uh, however, uh, I, I go back to these learning curves and uh, we were saying that uh, both solar panels and batteries have come down in price by about a factor of 10, maybe not quite uh, in the last 10 years. That's due simply to uh, the market. The demand is so high and the production levels are so high learning curve typically for a new technology, if, uh, if you double the output, the price comes down by 18%. That's a common uh, sort of rule of thumb. And that is powerful. So uh, this is what DOE has done with their earth shots. Uh, and the, they do have an earth shot on uh, carbon capture. And the idea is to get the cost of capturing that carbon down by a factor of 10 in 10 years. Now, you may want to do that by science breakthroughs. You may want to do it in part by incentivizing the industry to, to just be more, more efficient. Uh, and I think both are really, really important. When you think of CO2, it's very, nature uses it all the time. So photosynthesis, for example, it's CO2, water, and sunlight. So it's got to be a good feedstock. And to you know, populate the earth with all the plants that we now have, that worked pretty good. So uh, there may be ways to make it uh, more effective than it is now. I mean, there's a problem capturing from 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. You really do have to concentrate it and that's gonna cost you. And I think that's where maybe most of the cost is, but uh, that could be addressed. I mean, my, my feeling is that along with the other earth shots are worth, worth giving it a try. We may find that, okay, it doesn't really work, uh, but uh, we, ought to, we ought to give it a shot. Yeah, I saw a talk uh, uh, this summer at a Gordon conference about that uh, CO2 capture and they were trying to demonstrate these huge fans that they were yeah. using to suck in the, uh, the air to process it. And uh, what people didn't notice until uh, it was pointed out to them that that building was five stories tall and those yeah. fans were humongous in order to be able to uh, capture that. And they were using a tremendous amount of energy to produce that. So 
Um, it was that's, probably that was my only concern with that one. Uh, I, I do think it's always good to, to look at the, the scientific endpoint that if you, uh, if you do happen to find a way in order to uh, get yourself enough uh, CO2 to be able to work, at least you'll know how to process it by what you've done after the point of uh, utilizing the CO2. And so that's what we're investing in. But uh, uh, I'm always concerned about that, especially if somebody comes to me and says, well, do you really think that's going to be realistic anywhere anytime soon? So um, anyway, nice talk. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Scott, why don't we end with you? Sure. One last question. Well, I can't think of a worse starting material for a chemical chemist or a chemical engineer than CO2. Like it's not really. What about if we use bio routes? Uh, I mean, it seems like we shouldn't compete with biology. We should use biology yeah. and then deal with the, right? I'm like, if you were starting from a, blank sheet of paper why you would never pick co2 as your starting raw material because it's in its it's a low energy state it's the lowest energy yeah. state and yeah. the only reason why plants work is that they use lots of energy that's free yeah but why wouldn't we want to work on bio routes to deal with the co2 rather than trying to do physical chemistry routes and then deal with the bio the bio products we know how to deal with cellulose and things like that a little bit better than co2 so it's a it's a good point. I, I guess I would, and I, I haven't thought deeply about this, so I'm just brainstorming here. But uh, you might worry that uh, the energy, I plants do it with the sun, which happens to be up in the sky. And so they, we'd probably do it with electricity. Or at least that would be everyone's first thought because you can control that. Uh, and it's a question of how much electricity would it really take to do that? And how much could you really produce? And I, my guess is at this moment, it doesn't look favorable. But again, I'll go back 10 years and nobody thought lithium ion would ever be used in a car. And in only 10 years, now it is. So that may be a, an especially good case. But uh, if we put our minds to it scientifically, get the electrocatalysts and maybe there'll be photo electrocatalysts, for example, that use the free sunlight. Uh, we might be able to do it. I think that's that's the value of science that stuff that's improbable may actually happen. And whereas on the on the industry side, you only want to deal with things that I know I can do because they're too expensive otherwise. Okay, um, just to be respectful of everyone's time, I would like to just very sincerely thank Maria, Tom, and George for really thought promoting talks and um, spending their time with us this afternoon. I think what I heard big picture is, um, I think we can all agree that we as a society need access to energy and we're using energy at increasingly high rates. Um, the issues are becoming more critical every day. And we've talked pretty clearly about um, the current lack of competitiveness in the US in terms of global technology development, manufacturing and supply chain. And so we need to think about what this committee can do to help um, guide a strategy, accelerate a strategy so that we can close that gap. Um, I think what I, th what I thought was just so cool in terms of the themes from all three of you is we're talking about next generation technologies, but fundamentally all of this comes down to good science. So whether we're talking about separations for enabling recycling or talking about um, electrochemistry, chemical synthesis, these are all areas that the US could have significant strength in and that translates to a wide range of potential applications. And so I think use inspired science is how I think about it, but but fundamentally it comes down to just solid fundamentals. And I think we, we could think about how to develop that into a strategy. Um, let me just end by reminding you that tomorrow we're gonna have our closed um, session starting at 9.45. Uh, with that, let me see if Shelly or Jody have any final comments they would like to make. Well said, mm -hmm. Amy. All right. Yeah, um, excellent. I really loved the breadth of the presentations today and the discussion. Yeah, 
agreed. Um, okay, so before I let you all go, I just want to give a huge thanks to Linda for doing so much work to help us organize all this. Um, it's just incredibly effective. So you were amazing. Thank you so much for making this all happen. So with that, um, thanks, everybody. Have a good night. And we will have our yeah, closed session tomorrow morning.